Hello, I'm Dr. Kathy Simmons, and I serve as the Chief Veterinarian at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to day two of our virtual tick symposium. NCBA is pleased to partner with USDA to present valuable information concerning ticks and the pathogens that they can transmit to animals and to people. We are focusing our attention today on the current research as well as on prevention, control, and management of ticks and tick-borne diseases. We are especially pleased to have with us today Dr. Rosemary Sifford, Chief Veterinary Officer for the United States, who will speak on ways to normalize a response to exotic ticks and tick-borne diseases. Additionally, our symposium will close today with a panel of four state animal health authorities from states affected by the Asian longhorn tick. Each panelist will give a five minute update on the situation in their state and comment on, how on their current management and control practices. Questions and comments will be taken from the audience. If you had to miss any of the two day symposium, please know that it's being recorded and the recording will be available for viewing in about a week at the NCBA website. As you can see from the schedule, we have a busy schedule of speakers today. So I'm going to ask Dr. Bonilla to introduce our first speaker for the day. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Kathy, um, for that wonderful introduction to our day. Um, and, and we're very happy to, to be here as part of the USDA and, and working with NCBA on this. So we're going to get right into it. Our first um, speaker is Dr. Lindsay Fry. She's with the USDA Agricultural Research Service, um, and she is going to speak on some of the really exciting research that we have um, that she's doing in her lab on equine and um, bovine tulariosis. So I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I am really excited to be here with you guys this morning to share some of my group's work um, on what we're doing to help producers control bovine tyleriosis. Um, I am part of a really big team with ARS Animal Disease Research Unit, and we're co-located at Washington State University. So some of my team um, is part of WSU as well. And then I collaborate closely with Dr. Kevin Lommers at Virginia Tech, and also a few folks at the University of Maryland, um, and with an industry partner called VMRD, which is located here in Pullman, Washington. All right, so just to give you guys a little bit of an idea about who I am and what I do, um, I am part of the vector-borne disease research team at the USDA ARS Animal Disease Research Unit in Pullman, Washington. Um, we're located right in the eastern part of Washington, about eight miles away from the Idaho border. And our group studies both foreign and domestic tick-borne diseases um, in both the tick and livestock hosts. And so we work right at that livestock tick pathogen interface. And this enables us um, to determine the ability and efficiency of various tick species to transmit and acquire these diseases from infected livestock. It also enables us to study the immune response uh, to tick-borne diseases in livestock and then using that information um, to begin work on vaccine development and also to develop improved diagnostic tests that can be used by veterinarians and producers. And then finally, because we've got these diseases right in their hosts, um, we're also able to look at different treatment strategies for these diseases as well. And so um, the goal of all of these activities is to help our stakeholders, including US livestock producers, uh, field veterinarians and APHIS really control these diseases better. We're focused on Babesia, anaplasmosis, and tyleriosis, and my group specifically focuses on tyleriosis of cattle and horses. All right, so what exactly are tyleria? Um, they are bloodborne parasites that are distantly related to malaria, and they're transmitted primarily by ticks. Around the world, they infect cattle, buffalo, different species of equids, as well as wild ruminants. 
Um, and these parasites reproduce within red and white blood cells. So the photo that I've got on this slide actually shows part of a bovine white blood cell. And then in that cell, you can see the little structure uh, marked with an S is one of these Tyleria parasites just getting in there um, ready to take hold. People in the Tyleria field divide these nasty guys into two groups. We've got the transforming Tyleria um, and the non-transforming Tyleria. Transforming Tyleria are only found in Africa and Asia. These are incredibly nasty um, parasites. They actually cause a cancer-like transformation of the cells that they infect. And these diseases, Tyleria parva and Tyleria annulata, have upwards of 80 to 90% mortality in naive Bostaurus herds. So these are really bad diseases. The other group of Tyleria is known as our non-transforming Tyleria, and those are so named because they don't cause permanent changes in the cells they infect. However, these generally can cause pretty severe anemia and result in losses. So Tyleria orientalis, of course, fits into that group along with Tyleria equi and a few other Tyleria of variable importance. And so for the rest of my talk today, I'm gonna to focus on our um, non-transforming Tyleria, Tyleria orientalis. And so Dr. Kevin Lommers did a great job yesterday of giving you guys um, a really nice overview of Tyleria orientalis Aikida and what that's doing in the United States. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that too much this morning, but I just want to emphasize a few things. So in general, um, this is causing pretty severe losses uh, for some producers due to anemia and also to a lesser extent due to abortion and neonatal death. Um, my group showed, along with Dr. Lommers, that it is right now being transmitted really efficiently by the Asian longhorn tick. And this is troubling because this tick, as you guys have heard, is spreading pretty efficiently throughout the United States. Um, this tick has a broad environmental tolerance, so that means that it's probably going to do well in a lot of parts of our country. And of course, it reproduces parthenogenetically, meaning that males aren't needed. So in theory, a single female tick can give rise to a new group of ticks if it gets moved. So another interesting thing is that historically, there have been a few sporadic reports of Tyleria orientalis within the United States long before the Asian longhorn tick ever arrived here. And so that leads a lot of us to question whether some of our other native US tick species may be able to transmit this parasite. And so that's something that we really urgently need to look into. Now, of course, Tyleria cause persistent lifelong infections in animals. So once they get through that acute stage of disease, um, they go on to become basically a reservoir of infection for other animals, as long as they're in an area where there's ticks, or if producers do things like um, reuse needles or veterinarians reuse needles, you can transmit infection that way as well. And then of course, because the persistent phase is asymptomatic, and it's often even difficult to find organisms on blood smears in these persistently infected animals, um, we can end up with movement of infected cattle to different locations. And if those animals are moved to a spot that happens to have a tick that can spread this disease, then you can start another outbreak in a new area. So spread throughout the US uh, moving forward is probably pretty likely. So given all of that information, what exactly do we need to know to be able to control this infection better? Um, and so that's where my job comes in. So the first thing that we need to figure out is what tick species, in addition to the Asian longhorn tick, if any, are able to spread Tyleria orientalis between cattle, okay? The next thing I'd like to know is what drugs, if any, can we utilize to minimize clinical disease so that we can get cattle through that nasty acute phase and reduce losses. The third thing that's really urgently needed is a serologic assay um, for the diagnosis of T. orientalis, something that can be used by veterinarians um, and, and used quickly. And then of course, we don't have a vaccine available for T. orientalis yet. So the goal for my research team over the next few years is to tackle these first three issues in order to provide as much help to stakeholders as we can as quickly as possible. Now, we are also laying the groundwork for vaccine development, but I've been working in vaccine development for Tyleria for over 10 years, 
And these organisms are incredibly complex and it's difficult. So vaccine is a solution that's probably many years out there, but in the meantime, we wanna get some other solutions into the pipeline so that we can start to control this infection. All right, so the first thing that my lab is going to focus on um, is looking at what types of tick vectors can spread this disease. And so to give you guys an idea of what these experiments look like, I'll just walk you through the experiments we did to show whether the Asian longhorn tick was transmitting um, Tyleria orientalis. So we start by infecting a calf, um, and we do this by injecting that animal with T. orientalis infected blood that was collected from um, an infected calf in the field. And so in my lab, um, we've obtained this infectious blood stabilite from Dr. Kevin Lommers. So we wait around for that animal to start to show signs of Tyleria orientalis. And so when we do this with a needle challenge, just in injecting infected blood, this can take anywhere from six to eight weeks um, for the animal to start to show disease. So this is really an efficient way of, of causing infection, but it does work. Um, and we confirm infection by testing the blood via PCR. We also do blood smears to look for organisms. And then of course, we look at the animal daily to look for clinical signs of Tyleria, um, like jaundice, like developing anemia, things like that. Once the animal comes up positive for T. orientalis, we allow immature tick stages to feed on that animal. And so they're taking in infected blood from the calf. Um, those immature stages feed until they're done. We call that repletion. And at that stage, we collect all those ticks. We put them in an incubator and we allow them to molt to their next life stage, which is the adult. Okay? And at that point, we're hoping that we have infected adults. So we take those infected adults and we put them on a group of new calves and allow them to feed again until they're completely done feeding. And then we monitor those calves for a given amount of time, again, using PCR in their blood, looking for clinical signs, and then also doing blood smears to look for those parasites to see if they develop Tyleria orientalis. And so when we did this with the Asia longhorn tick, um, all of the cattle that we fed those infected adults on developed mild anemia with parasites visible on blood smears, and I've circled those in the picture there. Um, within 14 days of infected tick feeding. So the tick is very efficient at transmitting this disease, unfortunately. Remember, it took six to eight weeks for the disease to take hold with needle challenge, but when the tick is in the picture, 14 days. Um, and then, of course, we published that so that people would know that the Asian longhorn tick is a vector. So moving forward, um, we are planning to perform similar studies using other relevant tick species. And these studies are actually, they've started um, about two weeks ago. So we're starting with Ripocephalus sanguineus, that's the brown dog tick. We also wanna look at Dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick, of course, Ripocephalus microcluffs, and then Amblyoma americanum, which is our lone star tick. These studies are really important because knowledge of which ticks are spreading this disease will enable us to predict where in the U.S. this disease is really going to take off because each of these ticks has a different geographic range that they generally inhabit. Okay. So the second thing that my lab is beginning to work on um, is figuring out what, if any, treatment strategies can be used to help get animals through that acute phase of infection and reduce losses. And so the first strategy that we're using here is to look at other drugs that are already available on the market, um, drugs that may work against other Tyleria or where there's evidence that at least in the lab against the parasite that it shows some efficacy. Um, and so things we're looking at include buparvaclone, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, imidacarb dipropionate, which is the gold standard treatment for equine Tyleriosis in the United States, Nazaril, which is marquee, and that's used to treat sarcocystis neurona in horses. That's a related um, parasite. And then Draxin, and this is interesting because Draxin is just an antibiotic, but we've found at least through lab studies in a culture plate that Draxin inhibits tylerial growth. So it's a safe drug. Um, we wanna see if it will work against Tyleria as well. Now, if none of these drugs show any efficacy against Tyleria orientalis, our next strategy will be to screen large compound libraries um, using in vitro testing, meaning we're gonna have 
um, parasites that are in cattle blood cells in culture. And we're gonna look at the effects of different compounds on the parasite in vitro. That's our second line of, of strategy for doing this. Now, I mentioned before that I wanted to talk a little bit more about buparvaclone, and that's because I'm actually pretty excited about the potential um, for buparvaclone use. Now, I started out researching Tyleria parva. That's one of those nasty transforming Tylerias. Buparvaclone was originally um, formulated to treat Tyleria parva, and it works very well. Um, that disease has an 80 to 90% mortality rate. And when I give it to calves that are moribund um, on death's doorstep with T. parva, most of them within two days are about 70 to 80% improved following buparvaclone administration. So I've seen it work um, in countries where it's used. It's known to be incredibly safe with few adverse reactions. Um, it has a meat withdrawal of 42 days and a milk withdrawal of 48 hours. Um, it significantly reduces parasite loads in acute disease. So in Tyleria orientalis, what that will look like is reduced parasites in the blood, and um, that will allow the anemia to improve really rapidly. There is some preliminary data out of different labs that suggest that this, could, that this does work well in Tyleria orientalis. So we're going to do a formal controlled study in our lab, um, which will start within the next month or so. The other cool thing about buparvaclone is that it doesn't actually eliminate the parasite, at least in Tyleria parva. Um, we'll verify that in Orientalis as well. So this is great because it gets the animal through that acute disease, but it also enables them to develop um, immunity because they will remain asymptomatically persistently infected. So that animal is still going to be um, protected moving forward uh, in your herd. So that's a good thing. So the last thing that my lab is working on um, is the development of an improved diagnostic test. And our goal is to develop a rapid pen side antibody test that can be used for Tyleria orientalis. Now remember T. orientalis causes persistent infection. So if an animal has antibodies to it, that means that it is infected. And so a rapid test could be really useful because you'll be able to determine if cattle showing certain clinical signs have T. orientalis, or if instead you need to test for other things like anaplasma marginale. And so this will enable proper management of these cases, especially if more specific treatment modalities for Tyleria orientalis become available. Um, and then next, you'll be able to assess your antibody level in your herd. So you can determine which animals remain susceptible to T. orientalis, and perhaps you'll manage that subset of animals a little bit differently. Maybe you watch them a little bit more closely um, when they're coming up on stressful events like parturition. Okay. And then finally, you can use this type of test to make decisions about animal movement. So maybe you don't want to move your naive animals into an endemic area or into a pasture that's really heavily tick infected, for instance. Okay. So what's our strategy for developing a diagnostic assay? So the first thing we have to pick is a parasite target um, that we're going to look for with this assay. And so we want our target to be present in all of the strains of T. orientalis that are in the US so that we'll capture all of them with the assay. We want the target to have certain properties that allow the immune system of the cow to recognize it really readily and mount a really robust antibody response to it. And the other strategy that we're using is looking at parasite targets similar to those used in diagnostic assays for other Tyleria. And this is because there's a lot of similarities um, between different species of Tyleria and a lot of the proteins work the same way. And so this hopefully will enable us to identify the diagnostic target a little bit more quickly. So once we get a list of candidates, we're gonna screen those using serum that we've, um, from cattle that we've infected in our lab. Once we narrow the list using that, we'll screen the candidates again using a large library of serum from field infected cattle to double check that um, you know, pretty much every animal recognizes the antigen. And then when we've narrowed it down to one or two antigens, we'll work with our industry partner in order to complete final validation testing and then to market and distribute the diagnostic assay. Okay, so 
that was a really quick overview of everything that we have going um, in terms of development of control strategies for bovine tyleriosis. If you have questions, please bring them to the Q&A session today, or if you can't make it to that session, feel free to email me. It's just lindsayfry at usda.gov. Lots of people to acknowledge. Um, we collaborate really closely with Dr. Kevin Lommers. We wouldn't have a T. orientalis program uh, without him. My national program leader, Roxanne Matroni, um, Kathy Simmons and Denise Vanilla, thank you guys so much for organizing this. Um, and then my other collaborators, Glenn Scholes and Joanna Silva, who make this work possible. And of course, the cattle. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you, Lindsay. That um, was a really exciting research update. So um, and to remind you guys, you can put questions in the chat as we go. We will collect them and, and, and address them later on today. If you can't wait or just hold on to them. So um, we're going to move on, and um, we have another uh, USDA ARS um, researcher here with us today. Um, this is uh, Dr. Kimberly Lohmeyer, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the exciting strategies to control cattle fever ticks and, and wildlife and on um, cattle in South Texas. So with that, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, thank you, Denise, for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks, everyone, for the invitation and opportunity to be here this morning to talk to you about the research we're doing um, in Texas by USDA and ARS on, on cattle fever ticks. Um, I'm Kim Lohmeyer. I'm a research entomologist um, here at the USDA lab in Kerrville. I've been here um, almost 20 years now. Um, I've, and for about the last two years, I've been serving as acting lab director and research leader. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the, the uh, research we're doing on ticks at both of our locations in Texas. Um, the first of which is the Cattle Fever Tick Research Lab um, in Edinburgh, Texas. Uh, the, the Fever Tick Lab is located on Moore Air Base and is in Hidalgo County, so it's in the quarantine zone. And this allows us to do work with live fever ticks um, at the lab. We uh, maintain colonies of, of both species of both um, Microplus and Annulatus. And we're also able to do uh, on animal cattle work at, at this facility. And then our other location is where I'm located um, here in Kerrville, Texas. Um, we also do work with fever ticks here, but we can't have live ticks um, up here in the Hill Country in Kerr County. So all of the work we do is more the molecular and, and genetic end of things. Um, we can work with other ticks here though. So we also do work with, cat um, sorry, sorry, with Lone Star tick and winter ticks. Uh, Denise gave a really nice uh, overview and intro yesterday on uh, the importance of cattle fever ticks and what's uh, going on in South Texas, as well as uh, the work that the Cattle Fever Tick Eradication Program does. And I'm going to kind of pick up with that today um, and, and talk to you about the research we do at our labs. Um, we view the uh, cattle producers and the eradication program as our a number one stakeholder. So the research we do on fever ticks is all in support of bettering uh, the control practices for the eradication program. Uh, Denise touched on a little bit of this yesterday. I'm going to kind of re-highlight it a bit because it's important to talk about uh, the current control strategies that are being used, and then I'm going to use that as a jumping off point for uh, the research that we do. Uh, Denise talked about uh, the practice of uh, systematic dipping um, or spraying with uh, Colral, which is Kumafos, an OP uh, or uh, a caricide. Uh, this is the, the go-to tool in the toolbox for the eradication program. So if you're a rancher and you have uh, one cow with one fever tick on it, you're going to be put into the, um, to the, the quarantine program and have to go through this, this process of having your uh, ticks in your property uh, disinfested, if you will, from, from cattle fever ticks. So this process of dipping is very time consuming and it has to be done every seven to 14 days for nine months. Um, a couple of other options in there, once those cattle have been scratched clean, then uh, doramectin can also be used. And that's beneficial because that allows for, uh, instead of having to round up your cattle every seven to 14 days, you can do it every 25 to 28 days. Another tool um, is these ivermectin molasses tubs, and that's a um, molasses supplemental tub that's been laced with ivermectin, so the cattle uh, use this supplement and they get ivermectin from doing that and uh, can kill the ticks that way. 
And we also have um, a vaccine called BM86. Uh, the BM in that name comes from Boophilus microplus. Interestingly, uh, this was um, tested and uh, set up to be used against microplus, but it actually uh, ended up working better for annulatus. Um, as Denise mentioned yesterday, though, most of the ticks we worry about in South Texas are microplus. So we use this vaccine in conjunction with these other treatments, but it's just not as efficacious as we as we would like it to be. But it is um, a, a layered tool in this overall uh, program that we have for fever ticks. And then pasture vacation, um, that's another option. Once uh, the cattle have scratched clean, uh, the rancher can decide to um, practice pasture vacation. So that's completely removing cattle from the premises. Um, this works well, but only if you don't have wildlife uh, in, in the area. So you can remove the cattle, but if you have wildlife that are coming in and out of your uh, property, then odds are they're going to continue to propagate the fever ticks and in fact move them around. So what are some of the challenges with these current practices that we have? Um, they're, they're quite time consuming, as you can imagine, rounding up your cattle every a uh, week to two weeks or even every 25 to 28 days it is really time consuming uh, both for the rancher and for the eradication program and with that comes some high costs for both the program and the ranchers there's a lot of labor involved with this especially for uh, larger um, herds on large pieces of property this can be really time consuming and um, to round up every single cow and, and get it dipped out and then with that um, comes risks of animal injury um, animals being moved around are more likely to break a leg or be hurt in, in some other way. So that's an important uh, consideration with these treatments. Um, so definitely well, there's a need for long lasting treatments that can be spaced further apart. Uh, 25 to 28 days is better than seven to 14 days, but it would be really nice if we had options that were say 45 to 60 days um, or even 90 days. And that way uh, these this number of cattle roundups that had to be have to be done would be uh, greatly diminished. Denise uh, touched on a caricide resistance and that concern for the program um, with less uh, stringent restrictions in Mexico on what acaricides um, are being used and how they're being used. And we kind of have to constantly monitor on this side of the border uh, to make sure that the cattle fever ticks um, that, that we're dealing with are not already a caricide resistance. And then, um, just to mention again, the need for vaccines with higher efficacy. BM86 works moderately well, but we need one that works um, high enough uh, to be used as a solo vaccine for eradication purposes. Um, wildlife, uh, Denise touched on this a little bit yesterday, but I wanna restress how important of a challenge wildlife are to the eradication program. And um, prior to the late uh, 1990s, uh, the number of fever tick infestations that we were seeing um, inside and outside uh, the quarantine zone stayed in the low teens um, for each year. But around the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, we saw that number start to spike um, from, like I said, being in the low teens to uh, almost 100 over some years. So we started taking a closer look at what was going on. And that's when we really started paying attention to wildlife and the impact that wildlife was having on the um, fever tick situation in South Texas. Um, the, the increase in native and exotic ungulates in South Texas has just been exponential over the past uh, couple of decades. White-tailed deer populations have exploded in Texas uh, due to very few natural predators. Um, in the early 1900s, white-tailed deer numbers were kept low because almost everyone hunted uh, to, put, to put food and meat on the, the table for their family. Um, later decades, that became um, not as much of, of the common practice. People hunt now more for recreation rather than for providing for their families. So we've, we've taken uh, that natural um, de uh, selection of, of deer, uh, reduction of deer out of, out of the equation. And then in the last couple of decades, another big factor is uh, the ranching for hunting industry has increased exponentially and has replaced cattle ranching in some areas. Uh, imported exotics often escape from these uh, ranching for profit facilities and then can become established in South Texas. A lot of these exotic breeds um, do quite well in the South Texas environment. And of course, these deer and exotics don't respect fences. They go under them, over them, and through them, and can even swim the river back and forth to Mexico, bringing uh, ticks back and forth with them. 
And of course, in the absence of cattle, uh, we've uh, been able to show that fever ticks can cycle and uh, do quite well reproduce on white-tailed deer and exotics. Denise mentioned Nilgai yesterday. Um, I wanted to mention them again today because they really are um, one of our number one wildlife challenges for the program right now. Uh, we call them an antelope, but they're actually uh, more closely related to cattle. They're even in the same subfamily. So cattle fever ticks uh, feed quite well and reproduce um, on, on these animals. Uh, the population in Texas, we now think exceeds over 37,000 uh, animals. Um, this is a, an estimate, but it's a pretty good one. So uh, these were brought in in pairs um, in the middle of the last century, in a sense, as you can see, grown to, to be quite high uh, in numbers. And you can kind of understand why people have turned to uh, the hunting um, industry as a way to make money. Um, the average Neil guy hunt for a grown bull, um, uh, you can get about three to five thousand dollars for one of those. So it, it can be very lucrative and it's and it's understandable why why people have turned to uh, hunting um, as an industry instead of ranching cattle. So some of the challenges that come with wildlife, um, you know, we, we have our handful of uh, tools we can use against cattle, but we have even uh, less options for for deer and wildlife. And um, the only two options that we really have, and really only one of those is currently being used by the program. And um, the first of which is the ivermectin treated corn. Um, this is used by the program uh, quite frequently in South Texas, but this can't be uh, used during hunting season because we can't take the risk of someone uh, harvesting a deer that's been feeding on ivermectin treated corn and then coming into contact with that um, acaricide and, and not having been made aware of that. So um, that one can't be used during hunting season. Uh, the other one that we have is this um, photo on the on the right. We call this the two poster. And this is utilizing a normal um, corn or protein feeder on which these two uh, paint rollers have been attached. Uh, these paint rollers are impregnated with permethrin or a similar um, oily type of caricide. The white-tailed deer come in to feed on either the corn or the protein and this acaricide gets rolled onto the, the head and neck and ears um, of the deer and then that um, Acaricide migrates over the, the rest of the deer's body. Um, these are very uh, high maintenance. They're not super user friendly and they, re they just require a lot of um, observation and checking on, changing out these rollers. They get dirty quickly and um, making sure that the corn or the protein stays uh, full in these feeders because if that's not there, then the deer aren't coming in to use it. So this, this one doesn't get utilized very much. And unfortunately, currently we have no treatments for Neil guy. And Neil guy are very different from white-tailed deer. They are not attracted to any kind of a bait like whole kernel corn or um, protein pellets. So we have not hit on the right thing to consistently uh, draw them in to be able to come up with any sort of bait station uh, treatment device option for them. With trying to treat wildlife, we ran into also trying to uh, not treat non-target species. In, in South Texas, this can be difficult. Um, so this is one of those protein and corn feeders. And as you can see, um, the, the raccoons like utilizing it uh, maybe more than, than the deer do. And they can clean one of these out pretty quickly. So we try to, uh, we are trying to come up with treatment options that we can exclude uh, these non-targets. Um, in South Texas, the, the ones we deal with the most are uh, raccoons, feral hogs, and javelina. And feral hogs are a real challenge um, for trying to treat wildlife. Um, this is a, a feral hog um, up here on the left. The, the um, spouts on this feeder are at least 30 inches off the ground, so you can tell how big uh, these feral hogs can get. They are super destructive, um, can clean these feeders out overnight. They get uh, frustrated when the feeders run out. Um, they'll even chew on these snouts to make the opening um, to which they're feeding out of bigger. And when these get empty, they'll even uh, dump them over, as you can see in this picture on the right. Uh, the only way to keep these hogs out is to fence these um, feeders in and put a hot wire across uh, the top of it. The deer uh, learn to step over it so we can still treat them, but then the hogs and um, sometimes raccoons are, will, will stay out. And another big challenge with wildlife is surveillance. So we, we can't easily inspect deer and exotics as easily as we can cattle. 
So it's harder for us to keep a gauge on how infested these animals are and um, what the tick load that they might be carrying with them. So the only way we really know if one is infested is if it's killed within the permanent quarantine zone and it gets, gets reported or as part of a research or an APHIS led cull. Um, so we really need better ways to uh, surveil for these ticks on wildlife. So that brings me uh, to our current research that we're doing here at the lab in Kerrville and at the Fever Tick Lab in Mission. Um, we are tasked um, with coming up with new tools uh, for the eradication program and for the Texas Animal Health Commission to use for controlling fever ticks. And we're doing that in a lot of different ways. And um, we have a great team uh, with a lot of uh, different ex expertise that they, that they bring to this problem. So I'll start with kind of the bi biology and ecology end of the work that we're doing. Um, Denise mentioned yesterday, and some of the other speakers did, it, did as well, that larval ticks um, spend a um, most of their time off the host. So if you're looking at the time spent on host, it's maybe about 5% of the life cycle where the rest is uh, spent as larvae or eggs out in the environment. And so we really, with fever ticks, still don't know a lot about what they're doing when they're off the host. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, questing activity, how they find their hosts, what these larval ticks are doing in the environment. Um, this includes looking at impacts of weather and habitat on larval fever tick survival, um, how these larval clusters survive in the pasture over time. So with that, we're looking at things like degree days as well as calendar days and temperatures. And then alternatives to find ticks when they're off the host. Um, fever ticks, uh, when they're larvae, are not <clears throat> easily collected using dragging or dry ice. So we're evaluating some um, new tech new technologies for being able to find them on vegetation, things that uh, like a tick vac or a tick bot and we, that we are working with partners to develop and then evaluate in the field. And then um, we have a, a fever tick historical database that has um, a slightly over four decades worth now of infestation tracking. So as the eradication program uh, finds new infestations, we are building a database that includes information about uh, GPS coordinates of where those infestations were found, what host type they were found on, the number of ticks, et cetera. So this is uh, literally a gold mine of uh, fever tick historical infestation data. And of course, we're looking at uh, novel ways to control fever ticks. Um, Acaricides will always be the bread and butter of, of what we do in the field with fever ticks, but we are starting to look at uh, non-pesticide alternatives such as diatomaceous earth, perlite, and botanically based acaricides. These will likely never replace uh, acaricides like cumafos, but they can become um, a tool in our toolbox that we use in conjunction with these things, especially um, fever ticks. Uh, now are, we have infestations in uh, natural preserve areas in South Texas, and so they're not always excited about us coming in and using uh, caricides. So these type of um, botanically based or uh, desiccant products would, would fit the bill for treating uh, cattle or wildlife in those areas. We are always on the lookout for novel acaricides that can be utilized by the program. As these are developed um, by industry, we uh, put together partnerships where we can evaluate these for use for controlling cattle fever ticks and, and other ticks as well. Uh, we currently have one in the works, uh, a project in the works that just started at the fever tick lab with an industry partner looking at a, a novel chemistry and it's uh, formulated into a long acting poron. And we're excited about the possibilities of, of this um, acaricide for use by the program. Um, we're always looking for um, alternatives to coral or ways to use coral uh, more efficiently. Um, so we're looking at alternatives um, for use in the spray box. This can include uh, botanical products, but we're also looking at novel ways to decrease the, the sheer amount of a caricide that we're having to apply. So we're looking at new application technologies like electrostatic sprayers. And then Neil Guy, the, I mentioned this um, earlier, but this uh, is a big, a big piece of the puzzle that we, that we still haven't solved. So we're looking at what Neil Guy are doing in the field in South Texas. There's still a lot to learn there. Uh, looking at things like uh, tick loads, uh, seasonality of when they're uh, most infested, the habitats they're using associated with where the fever tick 
ticks are, what other tick species might be on Nilgai, and then uh, really importantly, looking at the pathogens carried by both the ticks and the Nilgai themselves. We have a study underway uh, with, a, with a university partner um, looking at whether Nilgai and other exotic species like, um, let's say, Axis deer um, are susceptible to Babesia infection. We're looking at biological control options as well. One of our scientists has developed um, this uh, remote, remotely activated sprayer to utilize enemapathogenic nematodes um, to try to control cattle fever ticks. So a Neil guy at a fence crossing or a deer at a feeder or fence crossing uh, triggers uh, this sprayer to go off. The sprayer uh, sprays out a fine mist that contains the cysts of these um, enemapathogenic nematodes. The nematodes then uh, find the fever tick on the host and penetrate the cuticle and go in and are a, uh, able to uh, kill those fever ticks. Uh, this work is looking promising. We have uh, run into some issues with getting this approved by FDA, but we're, we're hopeful we're gonna be able to navigate that and, and get these into use. We're also searching for uh, fever tick parasitoids. One of our scientists um, has studies going and is actually traveling back and forth to Asia uh, looking for fever tick parasitoids, uh, whether that ends up being a, a larval parasitoid or a parasitoid of the adults uh, remains to be seen. But we're hoping by going back to the native home range of, uh, of Microplus, we'll be able to uh, locate a parasitoid that might be able to be reared and then released um, in mass for controlling fever ticks in South Texas. And then um, last but not least, we have a lot of different uh, genetic studies going on. Um, really importantly, looking at ways to manage resistance, uh, specifically for Coral and for py um, pyrethrin, because those are uh, used a lot by the programs, so it's looking at ways that we can identify that mechanism. And then a uh, comparison of the differences between the microbiomes of the two fever tick species of Annulatus and Microplus. And then also identifying, understanding how sex determination works in fever ticks. If we can figure out that pathway, then that might be something uh, that we can exploit as a, a mode, a new mode of action for controlling fever ticks. Um, and then looking at uh, using genomics to look for genetic targets that can be developed into tools uh, for controlling fever ticks. And this, this would be things like anti-tick vaccines. Again, um, we've, we've worked on vaccines for a couple of decades now, but we still haven't found uh, the, the, the right one, the one that works well. Uh, we have a, a couple of projects in the works uh, with industry partners to evaluate um, a couple of different vaccine antigens uh, starting um, probably next calendar year. Uh, one of those would be a traditional injectable, injectable vaccine and another would be an oral uh, delivery vaccine, which if that one works well, might be a new tool that could be looked at for uh, treating white-tailed deer. And then uh, lastly, we look at genetic signatures of cattle fever tick infestations and looking at the different infestations and seeing if we can uh, determine relatedness. So um, are they related to each other? Can we track those back to where they might have originally come from? If we can figure things out about relatedness, then that helps us um, to direct the best way to, to stop and to uh, treat these infestations. And um, with that, I'll close, I'll, I'll close. Feel free um, to send in questions for uh, the, the question and answer session later or to email me directly. I'm always happy to answer questions and, and love to talk about um, the work that we're doing. And I also need to thank our other scientists at both of our locations I'm listed here. Uh, this is definitely a team effort and uh, we would not be as successful uh, with coming up with uh, this great research um, if it wasn't for this, the people listed here. So, thank you. Thank you, Tom. So um, some of you guys might be wondering, because we've focused quite a bit on Asian longhorn tick on this call, like why we would have cattle fever tick updates. Um, and just keep in mind that a lot of this research that's being done with cattle fever ticks is in some way applicable to any other tick, including, including Asian longhorn tick. And so um, this is exciting work and, and we wanted to share kind of what's up and coming. So again, thank you, Cam. We're gonna move on. Um, Dr. Michael Yadley from the University of Georgia is going to talk to us a little bit about looking at your livestock and figuring out what kind of ticks you might have. So let him get going on that. Thanks, Denise. 
Um, and so I'm excited to give you guys a short presentation today on sort of the how and why that we use tick IDs to give you a little bit of insight into what happens with all those ticks that get submitted to the laboratories uh, and they and need identification. So um, just to start off, sorry, um, I'm not going to bore you too much with that economy, but I think this is fun because a lot of people don't really understand where ticks fit into the grand scheme of things. So within the arthropods, we have the arachnids or the spiders and then the insects. And when you actually look at where ticks are, they are actually in the arachnid group. So they have eight legs, typically. Um, no antenna and two body sections, as you can see there. Whereas the insects have six legs, three body sections. So those would be the flies and the mosquitoes and whatnot. So if you have the creeps about spiders, then maybe you can add ticks to that list as well. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about king elephants because I'm certainly not creating veterinary entomologists uh, on this call, but I do just want to highlight some of the aspects that we spend time looking at. And a big part of that is mouth parts. So when you're actually collecting ticks and submitting them to the laboratory, uh, it's actually important to try to get those mouth parts pulled out of the skin because we'll be spending a lot of time looking at the various morphology that you can see here for the mouth parts. And this is just that picture I showed yesterday showing that nice close up of those backward facing spines that they use to hold onto your skin and these cutting plates that they use to cut into your skin. So if you recall from yesterday, if you were on, I talked about two major groups of ticks. One is the soft ticks and the other is the hard ticks. The soft ticks were sort of that weird group of ticks that live in the crevices in the environment and sort of seek out hosts when they come into the nest. And so we frequently don't see these ticks attached to animals. And so they're um, fairly rarely submitted to us uh, with the exception of maybe larvae that were attached for a few days, or as you can see here, the spinos ear tick. That I talked about that is of course important for horses and uh, cattle and other livestock. So when we get soft ticks in, we're particularly excited about them because we don't see them very often. But these are the weird ticks, right? So you can see here in this picture, it doesn't really look like a typical tick that you would notice. Uh, big thing here is that the mouth parts are not visible from the top. Uh, they don't have a distinct scutum, and I'll show you that in a second. They sort of just look like little brown leathery bags. And then, of course, our favorite spinose ear tick with all of the spines on the surface is a bit unusual. And so this brings me to the hard ticks, which is the vast majority of ticks that we see here in the United States. Um, and so on the anterior end, you can see these mouth parts stick out quite prominently. Uh, they can be all sorts of different colors and patterns. Uh, and you'll see some examples of that as I go through this talk. And then they have a distinct scutum. And so this is rather important for ID. Females, as you can see here on the left, have this incomplete sputum. Larvae and nymphs also have incomplete sputums, and it's essentially because they use uh, the posterior part of their body to swell up with blood when they're taking a, a full blood meal, and so they need the ability to swell. Whereas males, they don't take, uh, they don't engorge with blood, so they take very small blood meals and sort of just run around on the host looking for females to mate with. So they have this full sputum here um, that goes all the way to the posterior end. So as a reminder about the general life cycle, so we have the egg uh, hatches into those free living larvae that seek out a host. They feed, fall into the environment, and then those molt to a nymph, and those go into the environment, um, and then uh, molt to the adult stage, which finds another host. So that's our typical life cycle. Uh, and then I talked yesterday about how the cattle fever ticks a little bit different um, because it's a one host tick. But each one of these stages are potentially going to be found on a given host. And so it's important to be able to understand how you distinguish these from each other, because how you key them out is going to be different. So just a few characteristics on how you would tell these stages apart. First of all, larvae are going to be the smallest of the three stages, and they actually have six legs. So here they are being all confusing, not being the proper arachnids, but they do have six legs as larvae, whereas the nymphs and the adults have eight legs. Um, once you have that nymphal um, stage, you can tell it has eight legs, so you know it's either a nymph or an adult, but it's definitely not an adult, it's not sexually mature, so it doesn't have a genital pore that you would find on the adult stage. And then the way that you tell the males and females apart for adults would be the presence or, uh, of the half sputum or the full sputum. 
And I put here a picture of Exodi scapularis that's flat and one that's engorged with blood to show you that essentially the sputum doesn't change. What happens is the posterior again swells with blood. And then um, what we get most um, submitted to us is going to be adult ticks. They are the easiest stage to identify, luckily. But once we get those adult ticks in the lab, we get all personal with them. We start looking to see where their anal groove is and the morphology of their anal groove, the lengths of their mouth parts, and all sorts of different um, aspects of their mouth parts, um, the shape of the base of the mouth parts, and then whether or not they have these fun decorations on the posterior end called festoons. You can see here on all these. And so as you're going through that key that you can see here, for example, is just one of them uh, for adult ticks here in the United States, we would get to an answer. But that answer at that point is only going to tell you the genus. So you know you have a rhipocephalus or an amblyoma or a dermacenter. But of course, we want to know what species uh, these ticks are. So to do that, we then get even more personal. And so we have an army of folks that are sitting there and literally putting every single tick on a microscope and looking at all sorts of different morphological criteria. And you can see all of those here. Again, not important for you to learn that, but just so you can appreciate all of the different things that we look at to be able to determine what a species of tick is. And then what we use in the lab is a variety of keys, books, monographs, and scientific papers to take all of those characteristics that we just looked at and determine what that species of tick is. Now there's a number of ticks here in the United States that we can easily identify. A female lone star tick, she's very easy to identify. There's really no other ticks that look like that. Uh, when we get into the derma centers, a lot of the dermacenters look very similar to each other. A lot of the Haemophysalis species look very similar to each other. We have uh, three other native Haemophysalis species, and so it's important that we be able to distinguish, for example, the Walmart tick from some of our native ticks, especially when we're doing wildlife surveillance, because we frequently will find some of those oddball uh, Haemophysalis species on birds and rabbits and, and even deer on rare occasion. So, Whenever we're trying to identify ticks, we're not, we, we try not to just assume that, okay, well, that looks like a dermacenter and it's from the Eastern United States from a dog, therefore, I'm sure it's gonna be dermacenter variabilis. 99.999% of the time, that's probably gonna be correct, but we always wanna flip it over, take a look at some of the key characteristics because unfortunately, we live in a world where exotic ticks like the Asian longhorn tick are introduced. And so we can't just assume that things are our natives anymore which then brings in a whole bunch of other keys from all over the world. Um, and for the most part, if we have adult ticks, we, we can do pretty well. Um, nymphal ticks get a little bit harder to identify from certain areas, and then larvae are even more difficult because a lot of species don't have great keys or, or descriptions of some of the immature stages. Uh, I do quite a lot of work uh, in Guam and Africa, and in those particular areas, there are certain species of ticks that just are very difficult for us to identify morphologically. And so oftentimes for those types of studies, but also for studies here, um, we turn to molecular tools to be able to confirm IDs or provide us additional information about a particular tick species. And so, um, for example, we use this uh, molecular tool to confirm Asian longhorn ticks and make sure they're not some of our other native tech species. So if you saw my talk yesterday, you saw all sorts of pictures of ticks from all over the world. And when you look at these, you know, it seems like these ticks all look so different from each other. Um, of course, I picked some of the more charismatic looking ones. And so we've got some of the African bont ticks. We've got the rhino tick and the elephant tick and the hippopotamus tick down here. Uh, large African megafauna apparently make beautiful ticks. I don't know what's up with that. Um, but here in the United States, we have some nice looking ticks like the gold goose tick over here. But then we've got all these just brown nondescript ticks over here. Uh, and so it's certainly not as easy as just looking at a picture, matching it and going, oh, yep, this is definitely an African bond tick and you move on. You have to go through the keys. So for the United States, I showed you this picture yesterday. And so this is some of our more common species of ticks that we have here. And we've got the larvae, the nymphs, the two adult sexes, and then engorged females up here. Um, but this represents only a few of the hundreds of tick species that we have in the United States. And so we definitely have to uh, take our time and look at these individual ticks. And so 
I just want to step through some of the um, aspects of tick identification that can get difficult. Um, and my students laugh at me because they're always like, do you think this is easy? Um, one of them is damaged specimens. So I tried to impress upon you how important it was that we have full specimens because the mouth parts are really important. But unfortunately, the mouth parts are buried down in the skin of a, an animal or a person. And so when people go to pull them out, they frequently lose their heads. So you can see here representatives that have lost their heads. You can see this tick right here has pretty much lost most of its body. Ironically, I can actually identify this tick as a female Lone Star tick because she's got an incomplete sputum with a white spot on her back. This one, because of its color and the placement of the anal groove, I can tell you it's an Exodes species. But beyond that, I have no other characteristics to identify that to species. And then this tick over here came out with a giant chunk of skin, which is pretty common as well. Uh, and then once these ticks are preserved, it gets really difficult for us to tease this skin up away from it without damaging the tick ourselves. And so in these particular cases, we may be able to identify the species rarely, or we could get the identification down to genus. And in this particular case, these samples were coming in for Asian longhorn tick surveillance. And so I can tell you right off the bat, these are not Asian longhorn ticks. And so I didn't need to go any further with those specimens. This specimen here though, was a very nondescript brown tick with no anterior end. So we had to push that tick on to molecular work to be able to confirm what that ID was. And in fact, that was an Asian longhorn tick. And so that really uh, shows how we can use molecular tools to help us. Um, interestingly, this tick was just mentioned. Um, uh, this is Dermacenter albopictus. Um, this is the winter tick. And this tick is um, unfortunate for moose. So from the wildlife side of things, we really care about this tick because of the uh, ghost moose syndrome, where these uh, one host ticks will build up huge, huge numbers, cause moose to lose their hair and uh, scratch their skin, and they become anemic in the middle of the winter and die. But this tick also infests cattle and can be a bit of a pain. Um, what's a little bit interesting about this tick is that it has different color morphs. And so all four of these ticks here are the same species. They're all Dermacenter albopictus. You can see that these ticks on the left are females. They have an incomplete sputum. And these on the right are males. These pictures don't really do them justice, but the ones on the top are what we call the ornate form. And so they have really bright gold um, speckling along their backs, whereas these are the inornate forms and they're just plain brown. So superficially, when you look at these, um, these ticks um, up here look like Dermacenter variabilis because they're very ornate, whereas these ticks on the bottom would um, almost look more like brown dog ticks. So you have to look closely. Um, and then we have a, quite a number of examples around the world of ticks that look similar to each other, but ultimately they've been shown to be different species, um, oftentimes through the use of genetics or maybe biological differences between these ticks really suggest they're different species. But when we look at them under a microscope, all of these criteria that I've talked to you about pretty much will point us in the direction of a single species. Um, a very recent example of this would be the fact that Dermacenter variabilis, the American dog tick, which was widespread in the eastern United States and had some populations out west, um, actually has now been split into two species. And so the Dermacenter similis that I mentioned yesterday is the western species now of this tick. And then the Ripicephalus sanguinea sensulatu group. So Ripicephalus sanguinius is the brown dog tick. And it is found all around the world. Dogs are a common host for it, but it feeds on a huge diversity of animals and people. And we have uh, a temperate lineage and a tropical lineage of this tick, but there's also multiple other species that are within this group. They all get lumped together as Ripicephalus sanguineus because that's what they look like under a microscope. But when you look at the genetics of them, there's species in Greece that are separate. There's ones in Europe, there's ones in Africa, there's ones in Asia that are all unique species. Um, and then we've got the proper sanguineus, which are um, also quite genetically distinct from each other. So that's just some of the problems associated with identification of ticks that actually come in. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that not everything on a cow or a sheep or a goat is gonna be a tick. So they have lots of lice and mites and chiggers uh, 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 and all sorts of other things, and including these super happy or creepy, depending on how you look at it, um, keds that are pretty common on some of our hosts here in North America. So we certainly get all sorts of things in. 
I'll say if you're lucky enough to start picking off some of these small lice, um, then I feel good about your ability to pull up some of these really small larval ticks that we want for identification. Some of these are mites and would require actual skin scrapes. So you shouldn't find those on routine surveillance. So why does all of this matter? Why am I here trying to talk to you about uh, tick identification and why it's important for you to collect and submit these things for um, identification? And of course, I'm talking to you about it, so I think it's important, of course. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why. Uh, we'll talk about treatment and control throughout um, the, the today. And some of those may differ depending on the type of tick species you have. Um, most of these options are going to be broadly applicable across different tick groups. But as you just heard, uh, in particular with cattle fever tick, uh, the control and treatment options for that tick are a bit more aggressive than a lot of the other ticks um, that are out there. Of course, each different tick species transmits different pathogens. So knowing what your herd may be infested with may give you some insight as to what pathogens they may have been exposed to. Um, sort of the ticks of the past two days are the cattle fever ticks and Asian longhorn tick are of special concern. So it's really important that we have a system in place to have ticks coming in so we can detect whether or not those ticks are present uh, and whether any special action may be needed. As you just heard, uh, research is really important for some of these tick species. And so we may be looking at population genetics of ticks as a way of determining how these ticks are being spread across the country or where these ticks may have been introduced into the United States, for example. And so having representatives of those ticks from different areas is really, really important for the research side of things. So well, what can you do? Well, I, I don't expect you to start pulling up keys and identifying things. Uh, although if you want to do that, please get in touch. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but you know, you need a microscope for the most part and, and some training. So what we look to um, our partners is to collect ticks and be willing to collect ticks. You know, it takes time. We understand that. And so committing to um, being involved in surveillance is really, really important. Um, but if you're going to do it, um, you need to make sure that you are doing it properly, uh, looking for ticks that are of all different sizes and colors. You're going to want to do it at different times of the year um, because certain tick uh, species or certain um, life stages are active at different times of the year. Uh, and importantly, as I've mentioned a couple of times now, ticks can be quite small. So this is going to be uh, a picture of some nymphs. And I want you to see how many you can see um, on this particular image. Keep in mind, nymphs are those middle stage. And so larvae are even smaller. This is occurring after lunch, at least for me, on the eastern part of the country. So I don't feel too, too bad about this. But um, so the CDC a couple of years ago put this image out to try to educate people about ticks and uh, particularly Lyme disease. So there's some Exodes nymphs crawling around. And the point of this is to point out that they are about the size of a poppy seed. So they're quite small and can be easily missed. So if you were looking while I was talking, there's five of them on this muffin and there they are. So about the size of a poppy seed, which of course then led other groups to um, jump on the poppy seed bandwagon and they now have ruined bagels for breakfast foods as well. So there's your uh, poppy seed nymph crawling under bagel. So these things can be quite small. Um, the other thing we've talked about is that infestation rates can be really, really high on certain individuals. Uh, and so if you're faced with this sort of um, situation, this cow from North Carolina that was heavily infested with uh, Asian longhorn ticks, there's a ton of really big engorged females there. So they're going to be pretty easy to see, recognize that you've got a high tick burden and also easy to collect. But this is not always how these are going to present. So this is sort of our situation in Georgia. Um, back in September of 2021, when we had our infestation um, somewhat locally, we went out and we were collecting ticks off the cattle there. And so this is what we saw. And so this is pretty late in the year. It was September. And you can see all these black flecks here. So those are the uh, engorged nymphs. So they were fully engorged nymphs. They, some of them were actually crawling around on the fur um, because they had already um, engorged and separated from the animal. If you didn't necessarily uh, expect to look for ticks on this animal, you could easily think those are just flecks of dirt or something else on this animal. And then keep in mind that these are the engorged nymphs. Larvae on this animal would be even smaller. And that's particularly important because at this time of year, um, we tend to see larvae. Well, and when I say this time of year, I mean September, October. Um, and maybe into November, um, here in the southern range of the late Asian longhorn tick, we would expect 
more larvae to be out host seeking. And so we really, at this time of year, are gonna have to be looking for those very, very small ticks. Um, and so all of this is talking about ticks that are being collected from animals, but just to give you a, a quick uh, rundown of what, how we collect ticks um, out in the field. And so here's some of our students and staff out collecting ticks on a pasture, doing tick drags. Uh, and the thing about Asian longhorn ticks is some of these heavily infested pastures, um, all we have to do is lay this drag down. And instead of walking 100 meters like we normally would, we would walk three steps and stop because we would have our drag covered in ticks already. And just sort of to show you what the situation is like, we're, we're standing in the field, we're collecting ticks. So I just looked down with my phone and took a picture. So the game here is to see how many ticks you can see in this picture. And some of them are quite obvious. You can see them questing on the blades of grass. But if you look long enough, you can see that this is just covered in ticks. And just imagine a whole field like this. All right. So hopefully by this point I've convinced you, you guys need to be doing tick surveillance and you're excited about collecting ticks. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is collect ticks of all different shapes, sizes, colors, and from different parts of the body. Certain tick species may actually feed in certain areas more so than others, or a particular animal may have ticks only on one certain area. So you wanna make sure you concentrate on the ears, the face, the belly, and around the anus in particular. Um, ideally, what we would do is collect ticks into tubes with ethanol. Um, and some labs will pr provide those tubes to you for surveillance purposes. Um, but in a pinch, you can actually put those sticks in a bag or a tube and freeze them. Those are still suitable for identification. We prefer ethanol because it preserves the tick better and also makes it a lot easier to store and ship and also can be used for testing for different pathogens. Uh, yesterday, Denise um, mentioned a little bit about where you can get help with tick identification. And so she mentioned NVSL, the National Veterinary Services Laboratory. Um, there's also a variety of state uh, agriculture and public health agencies in different states that provide services for tick identification. There's also academic groups, there's private labs, uh, there's online places you can submit pictures for uh, identification. Um, and then you know, my group here at University of Georgia is SQUIDUS, the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study. Uh, we partner with USDA and others um, to do tick surveillance. And so we're also happy to provide services for tick ID and testing. And this map just sort of shows the past um, uh, 12 years or so of tick identifications, which was about 24, 25,000 ticks now. So uh, we're always excited to get ticks in for sure. And with that quick rundown, I um, can pause here and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you all may have in the Q&A session later on. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, that gives everybody a really nice perspective as to, you know, ticks on animals and we appreciate that. Um, you guys, we're running a little bit behind our schedule and so we're gonna keep going, but we may need to either cancel our break later or possibly shift it around. So if you need to step out for a second, remember this is being recorded. Um, and with that, we're gonna move on to um, Dr. Brent Cradil. He's gonna give us some um, information on prevention and treatment of tick infestations on cattle. Dr. Cradil. Um. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and present um, some of this information to you uh, today. Um, what I want to do is, 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 is as, as was said earlier, talk a little bit about prevention and treatment of tick infestations on cattle, at least the perspective that, that, that we have. Um, as we go through for the next few minutes, um, I want to first take a look at the economic impact of ticks and try to provide some sense of the importance of these um, of these particular pests and and why we're so focused on not just the Asian longhorn ticks but ticks in general um, and then look at some principles of control um, basics there and then talk about recommendations for um, producers looking at um, really chemicals um, tags porons uh, dips that are out there and how those can be used properly so <clears throat> if you look at the importance of ticks you, you put it in the context of beef and dairy cattle production in the United States and here in the U.S. today, we have um, over 90 million animals across 700,000 um, different operations, and that looks at beef um, as well as dairy. So it's a, a fairly large segment of production, agricultural production, and cattle are raised currently in all 50 states. Um, if you look at the impact of cattle, calves, milk, and milk products 
Um, they are one of the largest agricultural commodities here in the U.S. Um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 billion dollars in annual revenue and it represents about 20 percent of total U.S. agricultural um, income. So uh, you know, cattle production is, is, a, it, it is an important agricultural segment here um, in the U.S. One of the challenges that we have, um, particularly when we look at cow-calf production, it's a relatively low margin business. Um, this is some data that came from cattle facts that looked at um, 2000 to 2015 with 2016 to 2020 projected. Um, and what you'll notice is that on average, um, if we look at um, cow-calf profit or loss, um, the average producer with the exception of the years from 2014 and 2015 um, might make 50 to $100 per cow in more recent years, um, the average producer is actually losing money. So the margins we have to work on here aren't, aren't huge. And so anything that impacts our ability to manage those margins can, be, can certainly be detrimental to the, to the profitability and productivity of a cattle operation. Um, from my perspective as a veterinarian and focusing on animal health, one of the things that I try to do is use animal health to preserve animal productivity. And when we look at ticks, um, ticks, when they're on an animal in significant numbers, can cause some relatively substantial production losses. Um, one of those could be weight loss, and in a cow-calf operation, um, weight loss could lead to a decrease in reproductive performance. So our pregnancy rates may not be what we want them to be in a given year. Um, the other thing we might see um, when it comes to weight loss would be calves. Um, the weaning weights of those calves may not necessarily be where we want them to be, depending on the level of infestation. Um, we could see hide damage um, and hides for um, a packer or a, a source of income and any damage to that hide is going to reduce what you get um, when that animal is sold. And then decreases in production. Um, again, when we have a reduction in milk production, uh, we have a reduction in muscle deposition, that's going to impact the quality of the final product that we're trying to um, sell. So ticks can um, have a fairly substantial impact on how an operation runs. Um, that goes back to ticks, uh, the infestation resulting in um, that cow having to utilize energy to combat the stresses from tick feeding. Um, rather than converting nutrients into muscle or milk, um, they put nutrients into avoidance behaviors. Um, and again, the byproducts uh, of that animal have less value, particularly, as I said, hide. Um, some work that came out of Oklahoma in the late 70s and early 80s um, adjusted for cost today um, looking at amblyoma, amblyoma americanum, found that that one tick alone contributed to about $165 million um, in losses. So um, what, what numbers we do have, um, we know, as I said, can be relatively um, substantial. Um, the other thing that's important when it comes to ticks outside of their impact on animal productivity, um, indicators of animal welfare, uh, go back to their ability to transmit disease-causing agents. And I know that that's been a topic of discussion here over the last couple of days. Um, when you look at where we are here in the southeast, um, actually just had a case in the teaching hospital um, about a week or two ago, a cow with anaplasmosis, and that's something we certainly see um, on a relatively regular interval, um, different herds um, in this state. Um, and now with the Asian longhorn tick, um, teleriosis, um, both of which call red blood, cause red blood cell breakdown. Um, and sickness, um, there is some thought here that anaplasmosis may be one of the more common causes of abortions in cow-calf herds um, in this particular area. So, um, so, so those are challenges that we have to deal with too, is, is, is the, the, the potential to transmit um, blood-borne um, disease-causing agents that, that affect productivity too. So uh, with that in mind, um, we move forward into the realms of control. And uh, one of the things that I have learned over the course of time is with anything really, but ticks um, particularly, is that an efficient but effective control program um, requires an integrative approach. You, you aren't gonna take one strategy and have that one strategy be the be all end all. You have to put multiple different things together to have a control program that's gonna work for you. Um, and the control program that works in one operation is not necessarily going to work on another. Um, and so when we look at different methods of control. Um, you've got cultural control where we're doing everything that we can um, to prevent new infestations. Um, you've got biological control um, where you use different beneficial species that compete with or consume um, our targeted species. And then you have chemical control with pesticides. Um, and so when we talk about cultural control, um, uh, from my perspective, is preventing new infestations. Um, and so on a cow-calf operation, on a dairy, 
um, probably one of the more effective means that we have of preventing new infestations, um, particularly the introduction of a species with which we don't know much about or haven't seen before, um, goes back to biosecurity, um, checking and treating newly purchased cattle. Um, and making sure that they aren't bringing anything into the herd. Um, not only that, in addition to checking them, um, goes back to quarantine as well. Um, as you've seen earlier, some of these stages of ticks can be difficult to detect. Um, and so um, if we give them some chances potentially to develop to a, to a later stage and we pick that up before they're introduced, it gives us a chance to, um, to pick them up, treat them effectively before we ever get them into a herd. Um, not only that, um, a lot of the principles we talk about when we go into a biosecurity program um, can be beneficial from the standpoint of controlling other diseases um, as well, Yoni's disease, BBD, um, et cetera. So this is something that, that could have some positive benefits for the herd outside of ticks as well. Um, if you look across the U.S. at um, operations that um, in this survey from the USDA said that they brought animals onto that farm in the previous 12 months, 66% um, of those herds never quarantined any of the animals that were um, purchased. 28% quarantined, all 6% quarantined, some. Um, but when you look more closely at the data, generally speaking, we would recommend a two to three week quarantine period at least. In most cases, we'd like to see it up to a month. Um, a lot of these herds that are saying they quarantine, all of them probably don't quarantine for the right period of time. So um, these numbers are probably a little bit misleading in that 66% is an underestimation of um, how few people are actually doing what we would recommend from, um, from that standpoint. So there's an opportunity there um, from a prevention standpoint to, um, to prevent introductions by, like I said, um, looking for these um, animals that may have infestations and addressing them before they come onto the farm. Um, so, as I said before, quarantine all new additions, um, even home range animals after they have left the farm. We're getting ready here um, for our state fair to start in October. Um, so those heifers and those steers that leave the farm to go to the fair, um, those are animals that have been exposed to other things um, and pose just the same risk as a newly purchased animal might. Um, and so again, a minimum of two weeks, um, uh, four is better from the standpoint of other infectious diseases. Um, while they're in that quarantine period, observe them for signs of disease, whatever that may be. Um, it could be things like anaplasmosis. It may be um, evidence of, um, of something else associated with that tick. Um, and then check them closely for evidence of a tick infestation. And those who are infested, you treat them appropriately. Or um, an option would be any of those new um, additions, um, you could just treat them um, and from a preventive standpoint to reduce that risk um, even further. When you look at chemical control, what we're trying to do there is take drugs and distribute them um, onto the skin surface or via the blood circulation. Um, if they're on the skin surface, those attached ticks um, may uh, um, may be killed and the new ones might be prevented from attaching. So um, though that may be a way to get more effective control. Um, and those that are distributed via the blood generally require ticks to take a blood meal, so they have to bite before they do that. Um, these chemical methods are best used when other methods of the cultural and biological nature um, aren't effective, so they're not meant to be a primary method. They're meant to be done when the other things um, have not worked, but they're there um, and certainly available. Um, when you look at chemical control, um, there are different formulations that are available, which is nice because it gives you some flexibility to utilize things that are um, more amenable to your operation. So you're looking at things like um, sprays, and so some, some trade names of spray products that are out there would be Rayvon, um, Tengard, Rayvap, Atravan, Guardstar, and then um, Coral. Pour on products like Ultra Boss, um, Atraban, Boss Brute, or Permethrin, and then ear tags, which we typically think of in the context of fly control, also have labels for um, for uh, tick control as well. But you've looking at products like XP820, Sideguard, Corthon, um, Double Barrel Python, um, and some others too. Um, when you look at efficacy against different types of ticks, um, ear tags are probably best for ear ticks. Um, just because of where they're placed and where they're able to distribute that chemical. Um, and these tags, when they're placed, provide control for, at best, up to three to five months. Um, I think some of you who have issues with horn flies and face flies um, probably don't think you get that much control out of them. But um, depending on the burden, um, you can get a few months of control out of that, so they are um, a tool. Um, your sprays and your porons, um, when you think about using those, um, you've got to think about where the ticks attach so you get the best distribution that you can. Um, so you're looking at 
ear ticks, um, head, ears, and briskets, um, and then other species of ticks, um, looking at places around the udders, between legs. Um, one of the places that we tend to see them when we're working with cattle herds here, um, in the area of the tail head around the anus. Um, so that's a, a common site to look for them, um, and but would be a site that um, when applying these products, uh, would want to be a target to you because of the preferred sites of attachment. And generally speaking, these sprays and porons are going to have about two weeks of persistent activity, depending on the product that you use. Um, so again, they're not meant to be season-long control, but can give you some effect um, that persists for a short period of time, um, but do require reapplication during the course of the year. One of the things that's important to remember about chemical controls um, is make sure you always follow label directions. Um, unlike a lot of pharmaceuticals we have available to us in veterinary medicine, um, these products, pesticides, are actually regulated by the EPA. Um, and because they're regulated by the EPA, extra label use is actually not allowed in food producing animals, major species particularly. Um, and so withdrawal times have to be followed to prevent residues in tissues and milk. So um, depending on what production class you're working with, um, mainly beef and dairy cattle, um, pay attention to what that label says um, and make sure that you're using that product in the way that it's intended to be used as per, um, as per the label. We always have to be cognizant of that and how it's going to impact the quality and safety of the final product that we um, produce. Other things that we've got to think about is considering animal behavior as well as um, weather events when these products are applied. Um, so uh, rain events, um, if they're in the future, um, you might not want to apply it too close to that just because of it being washed off. Uh, are cattle going to go cool themselves in pond to dilute out the effect of it too? So just think about that. And then make sure you obey all safety precautions. Um, these products are very, very effective. They're great to work with, but um, can have some detrimental effects on people and other animal species. So that's something, um, again, uh, the label um, gives you all of those uh, precautions. Um, just follow those and make sure that um, uh, you, you look at that closely. Um, when it comes to chemical control, there is a website um, which has an online database database for registered pesticides that are appropriate for use in livestock and pets. And this was developed in 2014, and it is relatively well kept and up to date. Um, the nice thing about it is it's state specific. So whatever state you're in, um, you can look at that and you can search that by animal type, targeted pest, method of application, as well as formulation type. So um, that's there. Um, and the website is down here. It's um, veterinaryentomology.com vetpestx. Um, and that will again get you to the point where you can look up these pesticides um, and see exactly what's out there for the different um, pests of concern um, and get an idea of what might work best for you. Um, other things that um, I should mention um, when it comes to the use of poron or injectable um, dewormers for tick control. Um, first, um, in the U.S. today, there are none labeled for tick control that I'm aware of. And I've done a, a not an exhaustive search, but a, a relatively um, extensive search of the products that we use most commonly. And I have not found one um, that's labeled for tick control again here in the U.S. Um, other things that goes back to is a, a, a lot of them have a relatively short duration of activity. Um, and there's not a, a big advantage from what I can tell over the label products um, that are out there. Um, but the, the other issue that comes into that is within cattle herds is we're seeing more and more dewormer resistance, um, similar to what we would see within sheep flocks and goat herds. Um, and that's going to become a challenge to us in the future. So um, indiscriminate use of these products against other pests um, in a cattle herd may result in further loss of efficacy. So um, just be judicious with their use and realize that that that's not what they're intended to be used for here um, in the U.S. Um, stick with the label products for um, tick controls have been shown to be um, effective and um, use these in the context that they're meant to be um, used for because um, as I said we've got herds here that um, complete dewormer failure um, particularly with your injectable and pour on products um, and, and I fear that we'll, we'll worsen that if we continue to use them in you know for other other purposes. Um, so to finish up is just understand that ticks can be a source of economic loss uh, in some circumstances um, and controlling these tick burdens can, re can require the use of multiple different components um, of herd health, environmental management, which Dr. Hinkle will talk about in just a little bit. Um, when preventive methods don't work, um, chemicals can be effective, um, but just remember that label directions need to be followed, withdrawal times observed, um, and try to make sure we're not using dewormers by themselves solely for tick control, particularly in commercial herds, because we're going to um, sacrifice um, 
productivity and it will negatively impact your ability to control our um, gastrointestinal parasites and that will certainly have some impacts on productivity. Um, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Hinkle. Okay, thank you so much, Brent. So um, we're going to move along. Um, again, we're a little behind, so we're going to um, skip the break after Dr. Hinkle's presentation. But she's going to, Dr. Nancy Hinkle from the University of Georgia, she's going to tell us a little bit about pasture control of ticks. So go ahead, Dr. Hinkle. Thank you so much. Well, I think you've been convinced that Asian longhorn ticks are pretty nasty. We don't want them. Uh, I want to mention that my contact information will be included at the end of this presentation, and I would certainly appreciate any comments and suggestions, especially from those of you who've been dealing with Asian longhorn ticks longer than we have here in Georgia. We got our first collection just a year ago. Now, as previous speakers have shown, thousands of Asian longhorn ticks can infest an animal, including deer and other non-bovine hosts. So there's all sorts of opportunities for large numbers of Asian longhorn ticks to infest pastures and woods. So what do we do to reduce tick numbers available to infest our herds? Well, obviously, as Dr. Cradeel indicated, controlling numbers on the herd will limit ticks available to fall off the cattle, lay their eggs, and increase our environmental tick numbers. So we want to use the best available on-host tick suppression. But what do we do about tick-contaminated pastures meanwhile? Well, one option may be pasture burning. Although I'm not aware of any testing of this technique against Asian longhorn ticks, it has been used effectively against other tick species, as Dr. Yabsley mentioned yesterday. Dr. Yabsley and his collaborators have conducted studies on prescribed burns for suppression of other tick species, and they demonstrated the value. For Asian longhorn ticks, we'll need to know when to burn the pastures, that is, what times of year are most effective in reducing tick populations, uh, the frequency of burning, will pastures require annual burning, and such information as that. But meanwhile, what do we do with the ticks we've got? How can we protect our cattle and simultaneously protect ourselves from increasing ALT numbers. Well, mowing is one recommended tactic. Some of the most practical Asian longhorn tick control research is being conducted at the University of Tennessee by Dr. Becky trout Frexel and her students. I won't appropriate her data, but she has given me permission to describe the results that they've obtained so far. Her group has shown that bush hogging significantly reduced Asian longhorn tick numbers. Now, not surprisingly, monthly bush hogging was more effective than annual bush hogging, but considering the cost in time and labor, equipment and fuel, cattlemen will have to weigh the advantages and costs for each of their operations. One consideration is that Asian longhorn ticks are more numerous in woods and along pasture edges, the area between the woods and the pastures. So mowing pasture margins may be more important than mowing the entire pasture every time. But by drying the habitat and exposing ticks to sunlight, a procedure called solarization, tick populations can be reduced. Additional research needs to be conducted, but it would be anticipated that going from summer into fall, when the females are laying their eggs and dying off, while the tick larvae are hatching and preparing for overwintering, may be a particularly critical time to reduce vegetative cover and maximize tick mortality. Now, producers I've talked with just want to nuke their whole place, thinking that this will get rid of Asian longhorn ticks. Let me assure you, there is not enough chemical in the world to eliminate ticks. They're tough little critters and they have the ability to hide so that no amount of pesticide will get to every one of them. Pesticides are not the solution to the Asian longhorn tick invasion. But pesticides do have a role to pay in, play in tick suppression. In fact, we are recommending combination of a kerosite application along with bush hogging. Now, I'll be honest that we have not field tested this, but we're basing it on what we know about the tick. There are not many pesticides registered for use on pastures. Most of them are pyrethroids. You see in this list here, the first three are. So these are the acaricides registered for use on pastures. The first column is the active ingredient. 
The middle column is the brand name, and the one on the far right is the withdrawal time. That's the number of days that you need to have your animals off the pasture before they can be returned to the pasture according to label instructions. You'll see that all the pyrethroids, again, those first three, lambda cyhalothrin, zeta cypermethrin, beta cyfluthrin, you don't have to remove the animals. They can be applied with the herd in situ. Carboreal, by comparison, also known as seven, requires that the animals be removed for 14 days. And then malathion can also be applied to pastures, but it can only be used once per year. Now, if you remember what Dr. Cradill was talking about, he pretty much was mentioning the very same active ingredients and certainly the same modes of action. So I won't go into it, but I am certainly anticipating that Asian longhorn ticks will be primed for resistance, and it will not be long before we see resistant Asian longhorn ticks showing up because we're hitting the populations with the same modes of actions of the acaricides, both as adults and other stages on the host and as the off host stages in the environment. Now, when you read the label, be sure to follow the directions as Dr. Cordell said, and set your expectations realistically. For instance, Seven's label admits that it will only kill or will kill ticks only the ticks present at the time of application and directly contacted by the product. None of the products make long-term residual efficacy claims against ticks. Nevertheless, if you're going to run your mower across the pasture, why not add an acaricide to take out as many Asian longhorn ticks as possible? The mower will disrupt the ticks, making them move, so that will maximize their contact with the chemical. Now, some rigs combine mowers and spray tanks, as you see here, or you may have to rig up your own, attaching a spray tank and rig to the mower. Again, this gives us the best opportunity to hit the ticks where, while they're exposed so they can be directly contacted by the spray. But again, remember these pesticides only kill ticks that they hit directly. Now, I have a question. How do we prevent ticks from migrating from infested carcasses? If you've got an animal that dies on your property, it's covered with ticks, realize that those ticks are not going to stay on that dead body. When an animal dies, the ticks detach and they move away from the cooling carcass. These ticks can then lay their eggs, or if they haven't yet consumed enough blood, they can seek another host, neither of which we want. So how do we kill these ticks before they escape? I hope the panelists will address this question at the end, and I hope our participants in this session will provide input. I'll make the suggestion that we incinerate the carcass and its attached ticks right there. The USDA provides suggestions for in-situ cremation at the website indicated here on this slide. This is based primarily on their experiences dealing with uh, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and other disease situations. Now, I want to put in a plug here for Dr. Becky Trout Frixell, my counterpart at the University of Tennessee. She's been awarded a USDA grant to study ways to find and monitor ticks on cattle. In order to develop these procedures, her group needs lots of pictures of cows. If any of the beef producers watching this webinar are willing to participate, you can scan this QR code up in the upper right hand corner and contact Dr. Trout Frixell. Or if you want to, you can just email me and I'll put you in touch with Dr. Trout Frixell. Again, my email will be given on the last slide. Now, as Dr. Cradell mentioned, if you want a list of acaricides for use against ticks, the Vet Pest X website is there at the bottom of this slide. If you're in Georgia, we produce something called the Georgia Pest Management Handbook, and it lists all the insecticides, all the acaricides, all the pesticides that can be used in the state of Georgia for various purposes on various hosts. Uh, that can be just found by Googling Georgia Pest Management Handbook. But again, if you're in another state, you'd want to use the link at the bottom, the one to the Vet Pest X website. Now again, if you have any comments, suggestions, information you think I should have included, any questions or any follow-up, please email me there at nhinkle at uga.edu. 
I do want to express my appreciation to the Georgia Beef Commission for funding and also to the Georgia Cattlemen's Association for their unwavering support of our research. Thanks so much for your attention. Thanks, Nancy. The really great information. Appreciate you giving it to us today. Um, we're again, we're gonna we're gonna skip our break right now, and we're gonna move on um, to a presentation on normalizing tick responses by Dr. Rosemary Sifford. She's our USDA Veterinary Services Deputy Administrator and our Chief Veterinarian for the for the country. So we're extremely excited to hear what she has to say. Dr. Sifford, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, I do not have any slides to share this afternoon. So um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. And and um, thanks for the invitation to be here. Very happy to, to be able to join you guys this afternoon. Um, the, um, the information that I want to share is um, really taking a step back from the, the, the really great information that you've, that you've received um, just in the previous calls. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, um, to join all of the presentations, but I really look forward to, to being able to um, see them later because um, the information that I have been able to hear has been excellent, and I, I know you guys have had um, a great seminar over the last couple of days. But as I mentioned, I'm just going to take a step back and talk a little bit about um, the overall response. So not necessarily at the producer level or, or even at the state level, but just, you know, how we're uh, working with partners to try to um, address some of the issues with um, exotic ticks and tick-borne diseases. Um, you know, within veterinary services, um, our mission is to support uh, the productivity and profitability of livestock producers. Um, and um, and we have a lot of programs that we work in in this um, to to accomplish this goal. And you've already heard about um, some of the work that we've done, um, particularly around um, ticks and tick-borne diseases. Um, and um, part of that work um, has really been around developing partnerships that um, have helped to um, move forward with some of the research and and some of the activities that um, that you guys have been discussing for the last couple of days. So certainly we've been concerned for a long time about tick vectors and the diseases that they can transmit both to people and animals. Um, and with the um, introduction of the Asian longhorn tick, um, you know, that um, caused us to develop some, some additional partnerships to look at, to look at some work um, to add to what we had been doing already um, in cattle fever tick and other areas. We really um, try to support detecting and controlling ticks and the diseases that they carry, um, working through our partners um, to be successful in these efforts. Um, part of the work that we do is to help to bring together um, some of those partnerships. So I'll talk just a little bit specifically about um, some of the work that we've done and partnerships developed around the Asian longhorn tick um, that we hope will continue to provide benefits to us um, in years to come. As you guys have discussed over the last couple of days, um, Asian longhorn ticks um, have been identified in um, 17 states. Um, so uh, there's been um, a lot of work done in this area um, since the ticks were first identified and since we determined that the um, detection in 2017 um, um, has led to um, significant spread through a number of states. Um, VS has confirmed the Asian longhorn tick infestation in every livestock commodity in the U.S., and we know that they also uh, infest and bite numerous wildlife species as well as humans. Um, so there's a lot of uh, partners that we can engage us with to try to help um, address the, um, this concern for producers um, and for uh, wildlife as well. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is to start an information sharing network. Um, this right now includes about 400 local, state, and federal public and animal health agencies that have monthly meetings to share information on Asian longhorn tick findings and associated diseases. And this information sharing can really help us to determine um, uh, where uh, prior priorities for research um, and further work are needed and can help us understand some best practices um, that we might be able to transfer from one location to another. We've also coordinated a federal government working group um, to, uh, 
strategize about how to address the, the Asian longhorn tick incursion. Um, and this really helps us to work across um, other federal government agencies that have a role. Um, you've heard about a few of those agencies in the webinar over the last couple of days and really um, looking to stem the spread of the tick within the United States and then to look at opportunities and options that we might have for uh, preventing the incursion of other ticks in the future. Um, we know that these ticks can travel um, in um, ways and there are risk pathways that, that we need to continue to explore to try to avoid introductions of new exotic tick species in the coming years. We also um, uh, have tried to support um, work looking at the diseases that these exotic ticks can carry. Um, uh, there's been discussion here um, about anaplasmosis and thalariosis, and um, we know that uh, those are, you know, that's really the heart of, um, of what we need to address. Um, and so uh, we funded cooperative agreements with the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine um, to look at the spread of thalariosis in particular um, and help us to build better tools for diagnosis. Um, you know, once we have better tools for diagnosis, we can um, start to look for um, options for uh, treatments. We also work really hard to, to make sure the information sharing does um, move out to um, producers and that we can provide um, education and information. Um, we've developed uh, fact sheets and worked again with partners on their surveillance um, and trying to share information broadly um, through public uh, websites so that um, hopefully affected producers um, can gather the information they need to be able to, to look for um, treatment options. We like to continue to uh, bolster our partnerships um, with industry um, and create best practices um, across. Um, we continue to uh, work to fund uh, research and work very closely with the Agricultural Research Service or ARS um, uh, to look at what where we might prioritize um, work in this area um, to address some of the current issues that, that we're experiencing in addition to looking for, again, opportunities for us to develop strategies um, to uh, reduce the possibility of new tick incursions in the future and the diseases that they might carry. Um, as you discussed some over the last couple of days, our cattle fit Cattle Fever Tick Eradication Program um, is certainly a longstanding cooperative program where we work very closely with the Texas Animal Health Commission and, and very closely um, with the government of Mexico to control um, the ticks uh, moving into the United States. Um, we have a number of projects um, associated with that program looking um, with universities and with ARS um, to, to look at control and eradication options. Um, and as was just mentioned, you know, looking at control options beyond chemical control, um, how we might have uh, integrated pest management programs that can help us um, control these ticks. And then also looking at options that uh, might be available for um, our friends in Mexico to use to help control those ticks so that um, we can push them further away um, from the US border. Um, we also do work very closely um, with the University of Georgia through cooperative agreements um, to look at the spread of uh, ticks, both cattle fever ticks and Asian longhorn ticks, um, as well as the midges that cause blue tongue. And this work is, is also really important for us, um, at, particularly um, as we um, look at issues around uh, climate change and how that might impact the spread of these ticks or diseases that they might carry. So um, I mentioned earlier that we have partnerships with um, other federal government agencies. Um, and so I want to just mention again that uh, those partnerships give us the opportunity to, to um, address and look at other um, control options. We work very closely with the Food and Drug Administration as well as the EPA um, as we look to improve the treatments available for ticks on animals and in the environment. Um, we also work closely with um, CDC, um, as particularly if we're looking at tick infestations um, or uh, related that uh, pest that might uh, come from domestic animals um, or humans or that might transmit from livestock to domestic animals or humans. And then finally, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services um, to look at the uh, types of situations where um, ticks might move between livestock and, and wildlife. 
So we plan to continue our work on um, some of the long-term issues like the cattle fever tick eradication. Um, and we also um, work to address um, uh, specific incursions. We did have um, an incursion of New World screwworm flies into the Florida Keys in 2017. Um, we were able to um, address that incursion um, and uh, eradicate those flies. Uh, we do continue monitoring for New World screwworm and, and do have the, the program that provides the sterile flies um, down in Central America to help keep those uh, flies pushed back again from the U.S. border. Um, we also have a program um, to help uh, keep the tropical bont tick um, off the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, we have had an incursion there of tropical bont ticks recently and, and are working with producers there um, to find opportunities for um, control programs and to hopefully eradicate that tick um, from the U.S. Virgin Islands again. So in, in addition to working on those long-term issues, we um, we will continue to partner to partner and to try to build the partnerships um, so that we can um, look for opportunities to control these ticks and vector-borne diseases moving into the future. Um, we anticipate that the challenges will um, definitely continue, will not diminish in any way. And unfortunately, when it comes to vectors and vector-borne diseases, um, it's usually not um, an easy or a simple solution. It's usually um, quite uh, uh, interrelated as, as you guys have been discussing with the integrated pest management and, and um, trying to control these ticks. So we uh, will continue the cooperation and the collaboration to uh, look for research and uh, control options and try to um, share best management practices. Um, we really appreciate the need to continue to build those partnerships to reduce the likelihood of new infestations um, and to address the current infestations and the diseases that those ticks carry. Um, the, the information that's been shared here over the last couple of days is exactly um, the type of information that can um, help us all look for the, the next step forward. And as we um, continue to build um, through the research and understand, um, you know, new tools and techniques that might be available to us um, that can really help us to not only address um, the ticks that we have um, and the diseases that they might carry and other vectors, but also, um, again, looking for opportunities to prevent incursions um, in the future. With that, um, I, I know that you guys have a few more um, uh, great things to go through this afternoon. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to um, to stick around for, for those presentations either, but um, thank you for the opportunity to join for a few minutes and um, really thankful for the opportunity to be able to hear and, and, um, and see some of the great work that has been done in the control of um, these vector-borne diseases. Thanks. So hello everybody, Dr. Avery Street with the USDA uh, Veterinary Services Epidemiologist within the Cattle Health Center. I uh, work with TB and brucellosis. I am the Catalyst Center One Point of Contact um, and for cooperative agreements. And I recently started helping Dr. Benia with the Mexican Binational Tick System Group projects. That's who I am, and we'll go through our questions for today. Uh, this one is for Dr. Fry. For those drugs that show efficacy but aren't approved for use in cattle in the U.S. Will there be approvals for deteriorosis sought with the FDA? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the plan um, moving forward, but we need to give them data that the drugs work and that they're safe. Now, the good thing is these drugs are approved for use in several other countries, so there will be some data already there from the drug companies. Okay. Um, I think our next question is wanting to know the current distribution of Asian longhorn ticks. I think we had a map we were possibly going to share for that one. Yes, I can, I can share the map if um, I can get share permission. So this is, this is what we're seeing in the United States, and, and we went over this a little bit yesterday, so if you missed that talk, um, feel free to catch the recordings later on. I don't have a, a map of the, um, you know, the worldwide distribution of this tick, but, you know, we're seeing, we've seen infestations and established, um, you know, populations in, in Russia, Asia, 
Australia and New Zealand among other places. So that could that gives you kind of an idea of, of what we're dealing with. <clears throat> no, we haven't had any had any issues with that. Um, deer are uh, better at self-limiting um, what they eat than humans are. So they they their bodies tell them that this corn is pretty high um, in in fat and things like that. So they they tend to be pretty pretty self-limiting. So we haven't had any real issues with that. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question is, has there been any research into the development of PCR-based identification techniques? I don't know if that's directed um, toward Dr. You, Yadley, I assume. Well, <clears throat> so the answer would be yes, I guess, whether it's directed at the tick or the tyleria. So there are PCR tests available that can confirm if a particular tick is Haemophysalis longicornis, and there's also PCR tests available for testing for Tyleria orientalis um, Aikida strain. Is USDA, FDA, or any of the pharmaceutical companies working on new molecule, molecules for ticks specifically? Are there any other molecules or treatments being used? For example, any off, any off-label parasites, parasiticides. parasiticides to control ALH or cattle fever ticks? I'll take that one or at least start on it. Yes, the chemical companies are definitely working on this as a very competitive market, but as you know, the Environmental Protection Agency is very slow. It is a bureaucracy. So if you have any contacts at EPA, encourage them to get new carocides out for controlling ticks. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hinkle. Any additional questions? No additional questions. All right, well, I think, Denise, we're good to turn it back over so we can start our panel. Okay. Thank you, Avery. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Um, so if uh, you are on our State Authority panel, if you could turn on your webcam and show us your face. All right, like everybody. There. Okay. All right. So um, our next our next part of our um, our symposium, we're going to do something. We're going to kind of change gears, do something a little different. And what we'd like, what we thought would be really interesting is instead of listening to you know some lectures about you know what you should do kind of hear the stories as to what has happened in the different states that have had Asian longhorn ticks. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk to our state authorities here and they're gonna introduce themselves as, as I cue them. They're gonna give about a five minute um, or, or less presentation each on kind of what they've done in their state and, and how things have changed because of Asian longhorn tick. And then um, we have a few questions for them as panelists that um, we know that you're interested in hearing information on. So um, with that, I think we're gonna, we're gonna go and um, our first panel participant is gonna be Dr. Carolyn Bissett. Good afternoon, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Bissett. I manage the livestock and poultry programs for the state of Virginia. And here in Virginia, we sort of did things a little backwards, um, as we are prone to do sometimes, and, and that we found Tyleria first and the Asian longhorn ticks second. So in December of 2017, a very astute private vet responded to some um, cattle herd issues and deaths in a small uh, cow-calf operation. Uh, found some anemia. It was anaplasmosis negative. He did some additional workup and sent it off to some university labs, and it came back as Tyleria orientalis. Um, nobody really knew what to do with that information at that time. Uh, it was sort of a, a, a new thing, and, and so um, we thought, well, where is this coming from? And certainly we knew in other countries it came from the Asian longhorn tick, but 
that had recently been found in New Jersey. And so we thought, well, maybe uh, we should follow up on that. And so we had the producer continue to look for ticks, but he had recently treated for ticks. So there weren't any on the cattle at the time. But come spring in April of 2018, he gave us a call and he had some some tick issues and an orphan calf that was just covered in ticks. And so in, in April, those were confirmed to be Asian longhorn tick. Um, so it started off at one farm in Albemarle County, which if you're familiar with Virginia, is kind of centralized county near Charlottesville. Um, and from there, as we started looking and getting the word out, so we, we sent, we did a lot of outreach and education. That was our, our main activity there. Um, so we got word out to private practitioners, veterinarians, went through extension to get the word out to producers, um, did some webinars, some in-person meetings, and gradually the word got out and we started getting more and more ticks coming into us for identification. And the the map that Denise showed just a few minutes ago, you could see that along that western side of Virginia, um, we've were I I don't remember the, the I think we're up to 38 counties now that we have found the Asian longhorn tick. Um, and Dr. Lommer spoke yesterday, I know, on tyleriosis and how we've we've been looking for that. So our first step was really just to try to figure out the prevalence of the tick or, or where is it in Virginia? Is it, is it really here? And, and now we know that it's really here and it's, it's very pervasive. Very quickly, um, as we sort of thought about how we respond to this, you know, do we, do we quarantine? And it's hard to quarantine for tick species as Texas is well aware of. Um, and we were sort of balancing all of these thoughts about how to try to contain and very quickly we were finding the tick on wildlife samples um deers especially and and then that that kind of um turned into finding it on all sorts of wildlife species including birds and so once we knew that this tick was was being carried by wildlife we realized that we could not contain the tick um you know you can quarantine cows, but wildlife don't really follow quarantine orders that well. So um, we couldn't really go that route. So really our focus has been on outreach and education on trying to to do presentations to cattle producers and, and extension and others on how to prevent, how to treat, how to do pasture management, all the things that we've heard about today and the last and, and yesterday as well. So that's kind of the very quick and dirty Virginia story um and i'll i'll stop rambling now and turn it over to somebody else thank you carrie um uh dr dustin weaver are you ready to go sure can you hear me yes all right um i'm dustin weaver i'm the uh, deputy state veterinarian here in georgia and uh, happy to be here and part of be part of this panel I did uh, text Dr. Cordill about that question um, that was asked previously, and the source is the NOM study, the 2007 cow-calf survey, um, for the information on the uh, um, isolating the, the new arrivals. Um, as far as Georgia goes, our experience here started a little late. We're, um, we first detected the Asian longhorn tick in September of 2021. And um, subsequently uh, this year have found it in two other locations, um, Pitkins County, Hall County and Hambersham County. Those are, if you're familiar with Georgia, those are kind of in the Northern uh, third of the state. And all three of those premises have been uh, cattle related. Um, all three of them have been reported through passively through um, private veterinarians that have, um, like Dr. Bissett said, just kind of astutely aware of the uh, infestation on the animals and took took the time to report and took the time to collect the the ticks and submit them for sampling. So um, we're appreciative for uh, their efforts in uh, finding that. 
Um, we're pretty much aware and assume that it's a broader spread throughout Georgia. We just don't uh, don't know it yet. Um, I think as time goes on and and more locations are found, we'll uh, get a better idea of mapping for um, producers. But certainly, as we get the information, we try to to distribute it out through the Cattlemen's Association and through things like this. Um, our initial approach um, was because we were the southernmost finding was well maybe we can uh, contain it and eliminate it um, so we did place a, a quarantine initially on the um, premises um, and then treat the cattle but then shortly thereafter found it in a possum and uh, wildlife and so uh, along a similar vein have stopped implementing or uh, putting quarantines on um, producers um, the uh, the approach has been more now to um, provide outreach and do that through uh, visiting our local cattlemen's groups as well as um, webinars. Um, we've had a, a couple of webinars here in the state of Georgia and we're just very grateful for the partnership we have with uh, the University of Georgia, Squidus and, and the Georgia Department of Public Health. And so I'll stop sharing with that. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Um, we're going to um, go next to Dr. Michael Nault. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Michael Nault, uh, state veterinarian for South Carolina, former assistant state veterinarian for North Carolina. So I'll kind of share the uh, Carolina experiences here. Uh, in 2017, uh, there was a tick study done in North Carolina for the World Equestrian Games out near Tryon in Polk County. And uh, that's where the first case was identified in an opossum. Uh, out in that location. And that was right along the South Carolina border. So in our mind, it kind of already had traveled throughout the whole state without us really recognizing that right there. In 2019, we had our first uh, real experience in North Carolina in Surrey County, where uh, five steers, about 400 pounds uh, a piece, were affected uh, and, and died. Uh, the last uh, steer was actually found to have thousands of the Asian longhorn tick uh, on that animal. It was brought over to one of the veterinary diagnostic laboratories. Uh, they did do a full necropsy on it, could not find any organ failure or anything else or disease that would specifically cause anything. And as mentioned before, uh, Cornell University used to offer a 13 disease tick panel that uh, we ran through all the diseases, which include anaplasmosis, uh, thylaria, et cetera, that has been discussed over the last two days on there. And uh, all those results came back negative. We do know that there was uh, at least some anemia uh, in the animals. We aren't certain if some of, uh, uh, as was discussed earlier about what the toxicosis could potentially happen, the to uh, if animals get tick uh, tox toxicosis out of that. And that could be a potential uh, part of it, uh, or just from the shock of having that many with everything else. That was kind of up in the air right there. Um, that said, we worked on it in the North Carolina side where uh, we did have, um, at that point in time, uh, and it's still existent there, uh, the Department of Public Health worked with us in the North Carolina Department of Agriculture to reach out to the veterinary clinics and offered uh, free tick identification uh, two producers, veterinarians, and uh, we announced that throughout uh, the state on that part there. Uh, in South Carolina, in 2020, the first two uh, identification of the Asian longhorn ticks were in uh, basically pet shelters, uh, and they were along the North Carolina border, so we weren't certain where they brought the dogs brought over the border or with the tick or were they actually here in North Carolina at that point, or South Carolina at that point in time. Uh, that now has become moot as uh, this year uh, at the end of June, uh, we did have um, a producer, cattle producer, uh, run into a problem on a 10 acre pasture where six of the acres seem to have a very heavy load of ticks uh, during little seasonal bouts of the year. Uh, when he treated, when the uh, producer treated the location, it cleared up for the rest of the year. Um, but it, the producer did note that the uh, 
you could see the ticks on the ventral or on the bellies of the animals as they were walking around and they started to avoid that six acre plot. Uh, much like what was already talked about, we've already talked about treatment of the animals, treatment, working with extension agents, and um, basically uh, uh, is also about potentially what could be done in the pasture on that location. Uh, everything that we've heard about earlier, like uh, Dr. Bissett noted. So um, that's the Carolina experience. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Beatty. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Dr. Samantha Beatty and I'm with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And uh, I will say that our, our true experience with Teleria started this year. Um, we have known that we've had the Asian longhorn tick for quite a while through the work of Dr. Uh, Trout Frixel at UT. And so uh, we've kind of been anticipating that we would see um, some trickle down from our neighbors in Virginia. And so um, we had known that the tick was as far west as Middle Tennessee and uh, had anticipated we might see infection this year. Uh, I was actually anticipating that we would see it up in the eastern region of the state, but our our detection came um, just south of Nashville, south and west of Nashville. And so uh, we were notified by a veterinarian. We have a mass mortality reporting rule and about 20% of this herd was affected. Um, they had initially submitted an animal to our cord laboratory here at the state offices and um, also done some diagnostic testing, which showed a multitude of diseases, anaplasmosis, um, yonis, uh, some things like that. And so the veterinarian treated for, <clears throat> excuse me, anaplasmosis um, and was really um, pouring it to these animals with those antibiotics um, and to no avail, they continued to have death losses. So um, he and I discussed, you know, options and I, I suggested that Tyleria sampling be done. Um, those results came back positive. Um, in our investigation of this unusual occurrence of Tyleria in a county where we had not known to have Asian longhorn tick, um, what we found was that the animals were purchased from an adjacent state um, and moved across state lines without appropriate um, documentation and traceability information. And so uh, we communicated with the adjacent state, um, started working with them and found out that um, these animals actually uh, were part of a dealer uh, kind of sale, uh, internet transaction kind of sight unseen uh, with delivery. And so we are continuing to um, receive communication from that adjacent state about additional movements with this dealer. And we are starting to find in quarantine herds um, who have moved illegally and don't have the appropriate documentation. So that um, is ongoing. We have done a lot of work with Extension, uh, trying to do outreach with our veterinarians at CEs and with producers um, through our Cattlemen's Association. We started that actually a couple years ago. Um, of course, with a detection of the disease, it really brought the issue to the forefront and we, we obviously seen a huge increase in uh, interest about the tick and about the diseases that it transmits. Uh, we are hoping to offer the testing at our laboratory soon. Um, we are continuing to offer free tick identification to folks who want to send samples to our office. And we are, um, yeah, we're trying to establish our prevalence and the location of the tick and um, our domestic animals, we know we've got lots of wildlife that are impacted and we are working with our Cattlemen's Association and with Extension to really stress the importance of appropriate animal movements, um, sourcing animals responsibly so that you know what you're investing in so that you don't end up in a bad situation. Um, and also trying to give people more information about how to manage and care for uh, infected herds. And that's kind of what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, all of you, for sharing your experience. Um, I have a few questions for, for, the, for you as a group. 
Um, my first question that I have is, uh, from a state perspective, how do you think tick infestations on livestock should be regulated or should they not be regulated? So I'll jump in and share my opinion and then if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, I think tick infestations of animals um, can't be regulated realistically um, with any with any level of success. Um, ticks are moving on wild animals. Um, you know, if you have a large number of ticks on an animal and they're heavily infested, you know, you may that may happen overnight. So if somebody, you know, it's going to be hard to make that something that's reportable. It's also going to be hard to regulate a tick that, you know, um, obviously ticks move without our knowledge all the time. Um, it's much easier to regulate animals than ticks, but that in this particular situation is also not super realistic. Yeah, and, I agree. and Denise, we, sorry, Mike, you want to go ahead? Go ahead first. I was just going to say, you know, we, we tried with our first case, that first farm that we found Tyleria and the tick, we, we did quarantine that initially and required the owner to, to treat all of the animals um, before, before he sold or before he moved them. Um, and, and that's fine. We, you know, we, you can do that with a domestic herd or with a domestic animal, but when, when the tick is, is so pervasive in wildlife and like so many different species to feed on um you you can't regulate that it's just not realistic you, you can't regulate wildlife that well to begin with and i agree both with dr pity and Bissett on that right there that there's just no good way to go out and control this especially in the wildlife like it is right now um you watch the trend for it spreading already how far has it gone through wildlife actually that part spreading it to the states versus more than maybe some of the movements that are going on. Uh, so I agree with both of them completely on that. Okay, Dr. Weaver, do you have anything to add? No, no, I agree as well. Um, we, like I said, initially did the, the quarantine, but um, quickly realized that that's going to be ineffective in long term. Um, and it's uh, in the interest of the producer to report so that they can get some assistance. Um, and we do have it as a reportable condition uh, in that it, the heavy infestation, that's a reportable condition in the state of Georgia, but it doesn't result in any sort of um, regulatory action. Okay, thank you all. So um, our second question is somewhat related, but it has more of a disease focus rather than um, tick specifically. And that, thinking about your state, how do you see or believe that movement regulations help prevent animal disease transmission? I'm going to start, I guess I'll just throw out there. I think animal to animal, it's easier to control that. And based on what we already talked about with the tick side of things right here, that you don't even know if anything has gone on to there or how long it could take for it to show up on that part right there. Whereas with uh, permitted move or with the health certificate movements throughout the state, that states that go on for livestock movement, um, with the veterinarian at least looking over that for the regular diseases that we have out there, I think that that's fairly a good way to control it. But the tick one, it's just kind of, it's going to be out there for a while. This we just previously discussed. Can you repeat the question one more time, please? Sure. Thinking about your state, how do you see or believe that movement regulations help prevent animal disease transmission? Well, you know, obviously that has been one of the things that we feel led to at least um, this initial premises where we detected teleriosis and um, we feel like that you know I mean with any disease as uh, Dr. Nall mentioned it's important to know where animals are moving how animals are moving even if it's not obvious that the tick has moved as long as you have accurate traceability and you find it later once it's come into your state you're able to go back to the source and say hey 
you know, we think that this came in on these animals on this date. And um, with that information, as this disease moves, that is going to become more and more important because we're talking about, you know, we have 17 states who are impacted um, with the tick. And um, as it spreads west, which I think that it's, you know, I think that there's no way that it won't. Um, I think it's going to be important for those states who are currently unaffected to know where they, you know, to be able to trace those animals back. And that's really important in any disease. It's not just with the tick and Tileria. So it's really an effort to protect industry um, and help producers who may be impacted down the line, you know, better prepare themselves um, and also help us to respond and, and help keep our industry as a whole safe. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have anything to add for that question? No, I, no, I think they covered it quite well. I agree. And again, the, the movement certificates definitely help out with the traceability, uh, as mentioned. So that's really where it kind of comes down to play in there. Okay. All right. Um, we'll move on to our third question. What have you done in your state to help producers control ticks and tick-borne diseases? So I know for uh, for Virginia, a lot of that comes down to outreach and education. Um, you know, as we've discussed, especially with Asian longhorn tick, uh, and its and its fondness for multiple species, um, certainly just just limiting or trying to control that through movement, um, as we've discussed, isn't really realistic. But doing a lot of outreach, having people be aware that that we're you know that this disease and this tick is out there and looking for it uh knowing where it is knowing where it's spreading and how it's spreading and that kind of ties into working with academia and doing some research but really when it comes to producers it's a lot of outreach and education and then working with veterinarians that are working with those producers to know um what's out there and and what we're looking for and then hopefully we can get the integrative pest management tools out there to producers to use um and then anecdotally veterinarians can share what seems to be working better for them and and get that information out there as well i know we've had several uh years of talks at our our state veterinary meetings um lots of work with extension agents and lots of producer meetings with local cattlemen's associations and such, just really trying to focus on outreach and education. I agree with Dr. Bissett on that. And then honestly, it's with the uh, tick identification programs, both in North and South Carolina. Uh, the South Carolina case that was just um, diagnosed was actually through uh, that program helping out in there. And again, it's it's going to require all stakeholders to be informed of what's going on to try and get any type of successful uh, define what you can for a successful response on this or at least understanding of what to do and what disease what to look out for and clinical signs and the different things that it can, that these ticks can carry um as well as trying to work through on the treatment side of things um likewise tennessee has tried to offer um, tick kits to producers and veterinarians to try to do as much surveillance sampling as possible, tick identification and testing for Tellaria. Um, and those are, are still available through our state office um, and we will ship them to you or have one of our animal health technicians drive out and, and help collect samples. Because I think that awareness, knowing what your herd status is, is gonna be important moving forward as has been discussed in uh, the last couple of days. And also, the outreach and education uh, aspect is important. I don't want to say that we just roll over and accept our fate that, you know, we're, we just let the tick march. I think we do try to encourage best management practices uh, in the hopes that we can limit the impact that it has on our, our industry um, and just, you know, encourage folks to, to do the very best that they can, you know, making sure, you know, is it your herd status before you purchase animals and, and uh, using, uh, one of the things we had talked about was potentially trying to apply um, 
tick preventatives at markets um, to try to, you know, stop movement of, of the tick and that sort of thing. So we're looking at it from different perspectives. We're still early on in our uh, response, but we're doing the best that, that we can do right now. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else um, anyone have on that um, question? I was just going to add um, similarly that in Georgia, we do the tick kits as well uh, for the identification of tick for producers or veterinarians that are interested in the free identification. Other than that, I completely wholeheartedly agree. Outreach is, uh, is key. All right, thank you guys. Um, anything else anyone would like to add? I think what we're gonna do is um, give you some chance for some final comments, but I think we it would be nice since we have a little extra time to open up um, the time for questions and answers to you guys specifically. So if you have, um, if you guys out there um, have questions you'd like to ask anyone on this panel, um, you can go ahead and type Type them, excuse me, type them in the chat and we'll collect them and, um, and ask them to the group. But um, do, you, do any of you guys, while they're thinking about typing in their, their uh, questions into the chat, do you, do you have any, like after sitting here for two days and listening to all the great information and everything, like what is your take home message? What, what would you like people to, to take home in your state after this? I think for me, um, take home message is just if you're a producer, and I am a producer as well, if you're a producer, just to take the time to get out there and and look at your cattle, scratch your cattle uh, for ticks. Um, sometimes I think we see a tick here and there and, and don't think a whole lot of it, but if there's something unusual, um, then it could potentially be the um, Asian longhorn tick. And, about it you know as producers there's a way most of the common um spray-ons appear to work and are very effective and so i think that's encouraging news as long as we take the time to observe and and uh scratch our cattle um you know there's there's hope for us thank you uh, the other thing i guess we would also for the take is really look at a comprehensive um tick prevention program for your herds uh, as much as what you can do out there with what was uh, discussed today on the different treatments on the animals as well as what you can do out in the pastures on it. Uh, and uh, just like Dr. Weaver said, it's just a full awareness now that the ticks are here um, and how they are affecting things. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things right there. So just getting that piece out. I agree with um, Dr. Weaver and Dr. Nault. And, but I wanted to um, reiterate, and this is obviously preaching to the choir if you're on this webinar, but this response will be producer and industry driven, um, at least from our perspective. And so um, being educated, sharing with your friends who may not know about this, um, you know, making sure that you're looking out for your best interest and the best interest of the industry are going to kind of tie in together because we're not going to be able to regulate out of this problem. We don't want to regulate out of this problem. Um, we want to be a resource to our producers so that we can help manage it. But at the same time, it's going to take industry and producers being proactive and, and participating in things like this webinar um, and implementing what they learn to try to, to limit the impact this has on our industry. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with, with all three of my colleagues there. Um, we can't regulate out of, of the Asian longhorn tick or, or even Tyleria at this point. So I think being vigilant, knowing what's out there, um, getting those ticks identified, and Virginia has, you know, free tick identification as well uh, that the other states mentioned, um, and being just being aware and looking, um, sharing that information, going to producer meetings, really working with other producers and industry for what's best for your industry, I, I think is is the way that we have to approach this. 
thanks all of you all all really nice um, good good comments and I appreciate your time here uh, we do have a few questions that have come in um, I don't know if you need to stay on camera but if you could stick around um, there might be something that you could lend your expertise on um, but I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Avery Strait. She's going to go through the questions that we've received so far. Again, feel free to put in more uh, questions in the chat. We have a little time to address any of them, rather from this panel today or um, earlier today or even yesterday, possibly. Um, and then after that, we're going to we're going Avery is going to move us into some some feedback polls. Um, so so stick around. We're not quite done yet. Um, but thanks everyone. Um, for your participation um, in our panel here. Really good state perspective on what's going on. Thanks, guys. So, Avery? Yep. Can you all hear me? This time? Good. Uh, good deal. Uh, a lot of good perspectives shared. Um, looks like we got quite a few questions that came in here. Um, and we'll just, whoever wants to answer those. So we know wildlife do not travel as far as domestic animals, meaning domestic animals are potentially an important dispersal mechanism. Domestic movement of domestic animals may still be valuable for interstate transmission, particularly to areas further west. Can you comment? Anybody have an answer to that one? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, can you hear me? So I, I think that's, essentially a very valid statement. I think our Western partners are already very aware of the potential for the tick and the disease to move in. And so, um, yeah, I think that to make sure that we are still marketing um, Tennessee's herd or their product, and I can't speak to the other states, but I think they would probably agree that we would want to demonstrate that we are doing our very best um, to try to limit or manage the disease so that we don't um, have a negative impact on our industry. We're not um, perceived as a, a lesser product. We want to make sure that, that they know we're doing everything we can. Um, we still want to have that balance of trade. And I think to Dr. Beatty's point from, from earlier discussion, um that that those critical documents for movement you know that that veterinary exam and that cvi before you move that's part of the the reason for those is hopefully in in really doing some education to our veterinarians that are then looking at your cattle before they move they can identify those ticks and signs of disease and not allow those animals that may be affected to move to other states. And that's why we have those requirements for interstate movement and examinations beforehand. Perfect, thank you. Um, we'll go to our next one here. What impact, if any, does pasture spraying have on dung beetles? Yeah, I'm going to have to bow out on that one, y'all, because that's not my wheelhouse. Same here. <laughs> Dr. Hinkle, are you still on? <laughs> I'm still here. I was afraid that'd get tossed to me. Unfortunately, <laughs> these are broad spectrum insecticides, so they are going to affect the dung beetles, at least at some level. Now, there are certain periods of uh, the year when dung beetles are not out and active, so you'd be safe applying these pesticides then. Like most things in life, this is a trade-off. Sorry, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that answer. Um, next one here. Have you looked at macrolides in addition to tulipomycin uh, for treatment? Sorry if I butcher that. Um, back to pesticides. There are no uh, macrocyclic lactones or macrolides, as you mentioned, that include ticks on the label, to my knowledge. So they're not available for that use. Okay, thank you. Um, Uh-oh, we're still going down our pathway here. Um, could you remind me again of the injectable uh, erythrocytes and their efficacy? A caricide, sorry. Again, those are the macrocyclic lactones, and 
they're not effective against ticks, they're not registered for ticks, and as Dr. Cradiel mentioned, they do enhance resistance of our internal parasites, so we would prefer not to use them anyway. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. I, I wanted to add to you on that previous question, if we were talking about antibiotics, um, because I think there were two classes of antibiotics mentioned there, um, that that's not effective either. So um, I think the we're in the experimental stages of medical treatment for um, pyluria, but I don't I don't even think oxytetracycline has shown any benefit. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Let's see another question about the current distribution of the Asian longhorn tick. I think Dr. Benia showed that map earlier of the U.S. distribution. So we'll go to the next one here. Given the solely parthenogenic reproduction of the Asian longhorn tick in the U.S., can we assume a monoclonal population and therefore a decreased potential to mutation-derived resistance? I would argue just the opposite. If we hammer these ticks relentlessly with any group of pesticides, that means that any one individual that survives will be able to produce 2,000 offspring, all of which carry the same genetic potential that the mother did, and therefore we could very rapidly develop populations of Asian longhorn ticks that are highly resistant to any given group of pesticides. Thank you. I'm not on the panel, but can I jump in? <laughs> uh, sure. This is Michael Yabsley. So yeah, we're looking at the population genetics of this tick, and I agree with Nancy that you know because it's clonal, there there are con some concerns there. It's not a single uh, genetic lineage that's present in the U.S. right now. There are th at least three, um, and that's based on a variety of different molecular markers. But we're moving forward with a much more fine scale genetic approach to look at the population structure um, of HL throughout the US and throughout the endemic range as well. And so we'll have a better handle on the genetic diversity um, from that standpoint. Thank you, Dr. Yabsley. Any other comments for that one? Okay. Is there a generic link for the cattle ID survey from University of Tennessee? That would be a question that I would have to answer offline and get back to someone. Um, or if somebody wants to email me directly at samantha.baity at tn.gov, I can try to um, get that information to you. Perfect. Dr. Beatty. See, I don't know, Dr. Playford's on here. This is um, a question about yesterday's presentation. Um, following up on Matthew Playford's presentation on how Australia managed information on movements of cattle from tick infested areas to non tick infested areas, how can this whole topic be effectively communicated to Western states cattle producers? I don't know if anyone can answer to that one. Your thoughts? Maybe I can maybe I can comment on that. This is Denise Benia. So, um, so we would think that the first thing that the reason why we asked Dr. Playford to join us is exactly that, um, so that he could tell his story um, and how things happened in Australia and how they managed or or don't or or you could say didn't manage um, to to um, control this pick and take that story and try to put it in, in the context of the United States. Um, we do know that, you know, there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of um, ability for this tick to disperse um, into, you know, other parts of the United States. Um, and it, maybe it's a kind of a sobering thing to think that, you know, since they've had this tick for so long and they weren't able to stop it from moving, um, we might not be able to either. Um, and that's the bottom line. Um, we would be hopeful and optimistic that through education we could slow it, but um, it's, it's possible that just like Australia, we may not be able to do that. So 
um, I think that um, we can find other ways to communicate that that story, but this was a good start to that. Thank you, Denise. Okay, our next one here. Can wait till deer become infected with Tylerio or Intalis Aikida? It's my, I'm gonna answer this and then anybody who has more education or knowledge than me can shoot me down, but it, it's my understanding that they are not infected clinically, but that they can be a reservoir for the tick who uh, is infectious and can drop that tick off, tick off at the next premises. So I don't know that they actually have a clinical infection. Thank you. Any additional comments on that one? I had one comment just on the movement of animals um, to various locations. I think we're really talking about two separate things here. We're talking about the tick itself, the vector, and then also the the bloodborne pathogen. And you know, moving um, one or the other could have a benefit or maybe not a benefit. So for an area that's on a fringe of an endemic area, where they're thinking the bloodborne pathogen might be coming. It, it might be beneficial for that producer then to find a bull or breeding stock, like was mentioned yesterday, that is infected and has uh, developed a immunity against uh, thylariosis. So I think that um, it, it really just depends on how you, and where your movements come from. As far as the tick goes, I think that's e an easier um, thing to control because hopefully our veterinarians are doing their uh, CVIs and looking for um, the the health of the animal as well as the presence of heavy infestations of ticks before they travel. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Looks like our next question is going to go right back to you, Dr. Weaver. How can Georgia livestock producer or vet get one of the free tick ID kits? They can so, um, those through the Department of Ag to just um, contact us. In South Carolina, uh, we've got uh, how to do that on the uh, Clemson Livestock Poultry Health uh, website. Uh, so we do promote it out there for people how to do it. And uh, they can get free tick kits, uh, both in North Carolina and South Carolina from the Department of Public Health uh, in both states. Perfect, thank you. In Tennessee, you can reach out to the state veterinarian's office. We have some information online. Um, you can also just call us directly and someone will get you to the right person and we can get a kit shipped out to you. Thank you. Similar in Virginia, if you just reach out to um, these, the Department of Agriculture or your local extension agent, either one can help you uh, get some, some ticks to the right place. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is kind of in the same vein. Where does the producer find the vial with ethanol easily? I'm going to assume they're talking here about the free tick ID kit. Okay. Um, in, most of the, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. In South Carolina, I know that it was in the previous presentation, it showed that, but if we've also had producers and told them if they want to just use Ziploc bags. Uh, with an alcohol and cotton ball, just drop it in there and do the same with the clean pill vial if that, if that helps them out with that side of it. Okay. In Tennessee, I think um, we'll take ticks in uh, the 70% alcohol, uh, ethyl alcohol hand sanitizer. So it doesn't take very much. Thank you. Hi, um, and uh, hi everyone, this is Denise again. So also to remind you all that if you're from a state that isn't covered by one of our panelists that's telling you where to send it, um, we also do have our National Veterinary Services Laboratories that will take your submissions um, and you can, you can do the same. Um, some type of leak-proof vial um, with, with alcohol in it um, and you can send it in. You can Google USDA. Five 
dash, which is a hyphen, 5 hyphen 38, and the submission form will come up and it will show you where to send it. Um, if you have any other questions about where you can submit within your state, you can email me and I will respond to that. My email is denise.l.bonilla, B-O-N-I-L-L-A, at usda.gov. Thank you, Denise. Uh, let's see, um, back to wildlife here. Most of the species documented in the sitrep do not have large home ranges, so domestic animal movement is still likely the largest driver of long distance distribution of this tick. Can you comment? I guess I can. This is Denise again. Um, yes, there's a very good chance that Domestic animal movement is a, is a driver of distribution of movement of this tick. Um, also keep in mind, I mean, you have to think about it this way, right? You know, you're, you've got your dog and it's out in the yard and then it picks up ticks and you put them in the car and you drive to see family and the dog gets out again. <laughs> And maybe you spend some time there and you know and there's a chance for tick movement in those ways and and we do realize that that is a potential way that this tick is being moved around can we can we really keep an keep an eye on it we try to um but it's not really it's not really possible to document that in the, in the way that we have available to us now keep in mind though that maybe the uh, mammals don't have large home ranges but we've got migratory birds that are being infested with these ticks. So if you think about the, the flyways um, and the migration patterns of some of these birds, these birds could be moving these ticks around um, just from, from south to north, north to south, just an incredible amount of, of mileage that these birds cover. Um, so uh, keep that in mind too. Thank you, Denise. I don't I guess, think we want to get on the topic of birds. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I, I agree with the bird statement there. And I guess the other thing, too, is remember that sometimes, you know, with white tailed deer, you can have a five to 50 mile range on it. You can have five to 35 mile range on feral swine. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, it can move across by dropping into areas on that way too. Not saying that we can't rule out the domestic side, but you also still can't rule out the wildlife side. As long as their ranges overlap, it may not be one pig that moves at 70 miles, but it may be the pig that it meets up with in that border or that perimeter of range, so. Thank you. Any additional comments? Okay. Um, is there any transmission on bovine to bovine that is affected with reproduction tract? That was a little oddly worded. So do you think that that question is in reference to transmission through like breeding activities? That's what I'm, I'm guessing it means, yeah. If there's blood, but uh, otherwise, I would consider that a very low likelihood. Um, but this is needles or blood to blood contact. If we're talking about uh, thylaria, I haven't seen any data, but I wouldn't say that it would be impossible. And I would defer to people who are in the research areas of this to have a better answer. Thank you. Any other comments from the group here? I would think maybe different species, it would be a bigger concern with moving animals for breeding. Um, fewer than 30% of CVIs in the US mentioned parasites at all on the form. Would you agree that these should be revised? So it's adding some sort of data collection space in the CVI to mention parasites. I'm going to jump in and I may be over talking, but um, 
I don't think that that's absolutely necessary um, because you're talking about CVIs. Every state has their own individual CVI and uh, that may not be possible, but a veterinarian can comment anywhere on that CVI. And so if you're buying cattle and you're receiving them and you have a um, very conscientious or reputable seller, it should be no problem for them to ask their veterinarian to make a comment to the effect of no parasites were observed at the time that this certificate was issued. Um, there's, it's, there's not a limit to what you can add as far as comment on a health certificate. So that may be something you want to ask a veterinarian that you're working with to include, or if you're buying animals, uh, you want to ask for evidence that that veterinarian looked for that before you receive them. comments any any additional comments okay um this goes back to macrolides i'm told by industry sources that macrolides can be used for tick control with extra label vet script yes that would need to be addressed by a veterinarian Thank you, Dr. Hinkle. Okay, well, we're almost out of questions. Oh, we just got a few more. Um, we'll do a couple of these and then we'll switch over to do our poll and wrap up. Um, this question is about sheep. Uh, sheep producers are often encouraged to add cattle for mixed species grazing, internal parasite management. Would this potentially put sheep at risk? I think that, um, you know, the parasite's going to be spending the majority of its time in the environment. And so understanding that it's spending the majority of time in the environment, if they're rotating pastures, um, it, it's not necessarily going to affect it one way or the other. They might already be there, you know, if there's both species there. That's That's my view on it. Thank you. Any other comments about that question? I think if we're, if we're talking about the the tick posing any additional risk, I I can't say that I would see that. Um, you know, the, the the tick has a predilection for sheep and cows equally, um, so it seems to be. So I, I can't see that that would that would raise additional risk unless I'm not understanding the question. Thank you, Dr. Bissett. Um, We'll go down here. Has there been a documented case of tyleriosis through transmission from persistently infected cattle to naive cattle, e.g. through needles? Anybody seen a case like that? I am not aware of any, um, and there may be somebody who's not on the panel that may be more aware, but I think in general, I think that uh, if you're a producer like I am, it is worth the cost to change needles with every animal um, because you're, you know, the, the likelihood of transmission of other diseases, just excluding tyleria, um, you know, is, is pretty important, or it's pretty significant. So, you know, you're looking at your, like, your BLV, potentially anaphylaxis, so things like that, like, it's just a win-win um, if you, you go ahead and, I mean, I hope that I'm not the first farm, you know, or we don't want you to try to continue to reuse needles and be the person that finds out that transmission that way is true. I think just best management practices would avoid having to deal with that. Prevention is always better. Uh, any other On comments? Top of the injection site abscesses that might be there too. You know, there's there's other things that happen. <laughs> And then I think this last one is about um, if you're mailing um, containers with ethanol, that there's shipping guidelines for those, for putting those in the mail. I'm sure that's for probably us. on some of the sites. 
Okay. For us, you should be able to contact us here at the state veterinarian's office uh, in our laboratory and we can help guide you through the process of shipping those appropriately. Um, and that would, I can only speak for myself, but if there are, you know, guidelines, we'll be able to share those with you. We package okay. samples and ship them every day, so. Okay, I think that is pretty much it for our questions. Um, Denise, do you have anything additional to add? I do not, but I'd like to check in with uh, Dr. Simmons and see if she has any um, concluding remarks before we move on to the feedback polls. Denise, I just want to thank everybody for being uh, on the webinar today and yesterday and for all of our speakers being willing to share their time and expertise. I think that this is a great first step in management and control, uh, and that is awareness and education. So happy to partner with USDA on this effort and look forward to uh, partnering in the future on other uh, events like this. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Dr. Mark Lines, do you have any comments here before we go into the polls? Sorry, I'm having trouble getting off mute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, well, I just want to thank everybody again. It, echoing, you know, Dr. Simmons. Thank you all for taking time to attend today. The last couple of days. Um, overall, I think it's been a very productive symposium. I very much want to thank Denise and CBA, all of our speakers, our presenters, our panelists, because putting this together has been a lot of work, but I, I think it's very much worth it. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, it's going to be a live poll. So we're actually, this is actually kind of a really cool feature that we're going to be able to see some of these live updates that Avery's going to do with us. So please stick around as we kind of go through that. And then, um, yeah, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so can you all see my screen and can you um, see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. um, this is the Poll Everywhere platform, live time polling. For those who haven't used this platform before, you go to this uh, website at the top and the poll will come up. I believe Michaela put this in the chat for our attendees. Um, so if you click on the link in the in the attendees, it should take you right here. And we'll just go through these real quick. You need a yes, no here. Obviously, the answer is no. <laughs> I don't know. Is this a direct reflection on my presentation earlier? Oh, my goodness, I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> It's not reflective of anyone's presentation. We put it together before we saw the presentation. <laughs> okay, I can't see how many people responded here. But yes, this is the Asian longhorn tick. So majority of you guys got that one right. But oh, I will say that those who gave B, are not that far off because looking at the picture alone, both of those ticks do superficially look similar. Yes. But good on them for not saying C or D. <laughs> C success. Um, and apparently the pool is full, which I didn't know that could happen. So we will go on to the next one. So I apologize if it's not accepting your response. Okay, our next question here, will you develop a tick management plan for your farm based on the information provided during the symposium? So these questions just kind of help us get a better feel for what we can present in future symposiums to benefit you. What do you wanna know about? What can we provide to you? Um, what do you want?
Okay, looks like the bar stops moving here. So it looks like most um, will develop a tick management plan for their farm, or they're going to be working with their veterinarian to develop a tick management plan for their farm. So veterinarians are always a uh, great contacts to reach out to and help you develop that plan, what's going to be best for your individual situation um, and in helping you identify ticks if you are unable to. It will be your best resource for submitting your ticks. Okay. Which of the following are good management practices to include in your plan? We have checking animals for ticks, keeping the brush cleared at the edge of property, removing down trees and dead vegetation, and all of the above. We got 100%, so I feel like everybody passed the test here. Um, so yes, all of the above are good practices and some of the ones we covered in our presentations from today and yesterday. Do you feel knowledgeable enough to meet on this topic and meet and discuss with your tick concerns with your veterinarian? And we'll go in later uh, more in depth with this question um, when they send, uh, Michaela is going to send out a uh, poll afterwards and kind of get some more, more details, open-ended things from the participants to see, you know, if you, if you don't feel as comfortable, what, what would make you feel more comfortable to chat with your veterinarian about this? Okay, looks like most of us, most of them are yeses or not applicable. A few somewhat's in there. So for the people who put somewhat, make sure you do fill out that poll um, and give us a little bit more information about what would, what would help you feel more knowledgeable to have that conversation with your veterinarian. And looking forward, which of the following would you like to have more information on? Again, we really want to target this towards what everyone, what the producers want, what you guys want to learn about, what you want to see. Uh, that's going to push us um, for different topics in the future or um, different webinars that we can host. No one wants to know anything about biosecurity. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to assume that means every firm has great biosecurity. Okay, uh, looks like tick-borne diseases is the one with the most votes to have more information on, along with control of ticks on pastures and novel approaches for tick control. So thank you, that is good feedback for us in the future. Do you know who to contact to get more information on these topics, on tick-borne diseases? And we had our panel with some of our state representatives on today. Um, they give you some state-specific information, as well as Dr. Benilla shared uh, MDSL submission, how to go about that in the USDA website. Okay, looks like mostly everybody knows who to contact here, 79%, uh, and most have a general idea of whom to contact. So your uh, State Department of Ag um, is probably gonna be your best hands-on, um, or again, the USDA website has more information. Okay. Hopefully you guys can still see this. Can you see my screen or did it kick me out? I think it kicked you out. Okay. 
just one more question here. Okay, uh, so some of you already voted, just what sector do you represent? How can we target these um, presentations in the future? Okay. And then we have other producer and other, I don't see anybody voting on this so other producer would be sheep goats equine um other livestock producer okay looks like they're about holding steady so a lot of people from state local government some academia some federal government and some cattle producers And then I may skip through these because I didn't see any people select other as a response. Okay, I think that is all for our surveys today. Um, Denise, do you have any closing comments? For everybody, just want to thank everybody again for joining today and doing the uh, polls with us. That really helps us out. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Avery, and, and thanks everyone. This is going to conclude our our tick symposium. Hope you all enjoyed it. Um, again, reach out if you have any questions, comments, and look for those um, poll questions. Look for the link that's going to come out um, from NCDA that is going to follow up afterwards on some other questions about the symposium so i think with that again thanks everyone and have a nice day thank you everybody